I will be your shield in the fiercest battle out of vengeance. From all these arrows in the sword, I will will keep you from danger. Let me be your shield. We have you go for orbit here. Go for orbit. Pilot observes yeah. the earth below and the heavens beyond. Oh, yeah, Over yeah. Oh, it's just you, me, and the odds. We stuck together, we two peas in a pod. Get dealt the bad hand, I'm there seizing the cards. We'll never be separated till we see in the gods. We've been low together, high forever. Long as we go together, we'll die, we'll never be alike. Couldn't let the darkness try you ever. Truth in my word, you I lie to never. And when the world gets a little too hard, wipe your eyes, put away your sorrow. When it's war, I'll be leading the charge. And I'll be still fighting for you tomorrow. Yeah, even with a blindfold or in different time zones. Could find my way to you with my eyes closed. There's nothing between us. Go to Mars and Venus. Stand in front of every one of them rocks. They slinging and be a shield. the gods of the nations are idle, but the Lord made the heavens. Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Why? Why must man go into space? You may be facing tribulation, but don't let it get you down. What I'm saying may take patience, but you're gonna make it out. I scratch my own two feet to pull you to safety. When the fires are burning, burning like crazy, carnage around but you won't feel no pain. I will take your place, I'll be. Thus saith the Lord God, I will also destroy the idols, and I will cause their images to cease. strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him, and I am helped. Therefore my heart greatly rejoices, and with my song will I praise him. Hello and welcome to Idol Killer, a ministry dedicated to destroying sacred cows of Christ. I'm your host, Warren McGrew. Let's go right there. Uh, today we're going to be doing a Q&A, so uh, I hope you brought some verses or uh, questions that you had regarding Gravity, original sin, and where to kill. That whole topic. A lot of times, oh no, the mic sounds bad on people. The sound is bad and choppy. Oh no, that is not good. Not good at all. Darn. Um, let's see here. We can hear it. I have not done anything. My microphone's set up, and I 
I need, I, we need me to do a fundraiser if I can get donations to hire um, uh, engineers. That's what we need. I don't feel there needs a professional talent. Is, is the audio sufficient, or should I scrap this and try again another time? Y'all let me know. Is the audio okay? Are you, should we trade for tape? Let me, let me see what I can do here, folks. Hold on one second. I'll be right back. Okay, I uh, I tried to log out and log back in. Is this is this better? Can we understand what I'm saying now? I'm waiting for the uh, <clears throat> the comments in the side chat here to tell me if we should proceed or reschedule. Oh no. Okay. Oh, much better, much better. Okay, cool. All right. Cool, cool, cool. Okay. All right, we're going to go forward, folks. Thank you for uh, bearing with me here through some technical difficulties. Proceed. All right, we are good to go. Jordan has given us the official green light. So uh, if anyone else wants to complain, we'll just blame Jordan. It's his fault. Um, cool deal. All right. So thank you so much for tuning in. Today's episode is going to be a special Q&A on total depravity and original sin. So if you have verses that uh, you think teach this, if you have verses that you think refute it, anything related to either defending or refuting this doctrine, bring it. Uh, just make sure you, you mark your comments over here in the side or down here, wherever, whatever you're watching it on. Um, <laughs> BJ says, I look like I'm in a, a room from uh, the, the future of Bill and Ted. I am. Um, I am. I don't know if you can see me, but I'm I'm doing the the hologram uh, uh, that was in the uh, yes, excellent. And 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 uh, you want we want to make sure that we are promoting the the philosophy of of be excellent to one another. And uh, now that the audio is working, we can party on. Um, but so today we're going to be looking at uh, Q and A about uh, original sin, total depravity, those things that. Um, are related to this. And uh, let me go ahead and pull this up here real quick. And here we go. So if you've, uh, if you've tuned in before, if you're familiar with the channel, we have a playlist entitled, uh, Are We Born Sinners? And uh, in here, it's an ongoing um, series on, on original sin, total depravity. And uh, episode one is really intended to provide a steel man of these doctrines. There is no criticism of either original sin or total depravity in episode one. It's simply an articulation of these doctrines uh, through historic confessions, through um, statements of various individuals that affirm this. So I wanted to give a good foundation for these beliefs in the words of those who affirm it. So as we would have a good working understanding moving forward, so whenever I would criticize a particular point or show how it was incompatible with scripture, I, I, it wouldn't be able to be said that I was engaging with the straw man. I really wanted to steel man this. And so um, this, this requires a, a fair amount of production, uh, a lot of time to put these things together. I know it may not look like it because of my, my poor editing skills, but uh, it really takes a lot of time to edit these sorts of things together. Um, and you'll see that we have some uh, addressing like an undercutting defeater, addressing the incarnation, the hypostatic union, um, the yetzer, the epithumia, concupiscence, infant damnation, the age of accountability. Um, we go into like Genesis 6-5, uh, 
uh, the several passages from Job that are claimed to teach it, um, Ephesians 2. And so um, I, I, I have some resources here. And so there um, you're going to find uh, something that's a little bit more well thought out, a little more cohesive, something that is uh, intended to be an actual presentation, whereas today's just Q&A. I've got a few notes on a couple of passages, but we're just going to kind of review this together. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to do, let's see, um, here we go. I wanted to provide a working definition. So I'm going to use the same working definition that I provided in that episode one. Uh, so we'll see here that original sin asserts that as a result of Adam's sin in Eden, God cursed all men to be born stained by this sin, possessing corrupted natures and sharing in Adam's guilt. Uh, this is often referred to as concupiscence. The, the concept of original sin was developed in the writings of Augustine. He argued that the stain on mankind was best defined as concupiscence, like a base uh, sexual desire, carnal lust. Uh, that this end, uh, to this end, sin was a kind of a sexually transmitted disease. As such, all men who are born, um, all men who are conceived in the natural way are born with their will, mind, body, uh, their soul corrupt and deserving God's wrath. And um, while you find some uh, inclinations of like maybe traducianism or inherited consequence from the sin of Adam, uh, original sin wasn't uh, formally articulated until Augustine came along and kind of combined some of these ancillary concepts into a cohesive doctrine called original sin. So we credit him as first uh, formally articulating it, but there are hints of it elsewhere. Somebody might point to, you know, the writings of um, an earlier church father talking about their view on maybe traducianism, the origin of the soul. Um, they may end up pointing to a different uh, church father talking about inherited sin. Uh, but it was really Augustine who kind of put all this together. And um, total depravity uh, is an evolution in the teaching of original sin. Um, really, it, it's more of a clarification. Total depravity is the reformed kind of Protestant, but mainly reformed variant of original sin. The concern is that when we say original sin, people might think of eating an apple or the forbidden fruit, whatever that was. Um, and so in order to distinguish this state of fallenness from the original sin, reformers prefer to use the term total depravity. And so this kind of focuses on the consequence of the original sin rather than conflating it with the original sin. But uh, total depravity is an evolution in this uh, uh, Augustinian um, anthropology. Uh, its articulation can be seen in the writings of the reformers, and they asserted that as a result of Adam's sin in Eden, all mankind is born spiritually dead. So for this reason, you'll often hear it referred to as total inability, which we'll, we can get into more. But they say that we're, we're born possessing both Adam's guilt and his sin nature, that man's intellect, his will, body, and spirit are so corrupt that we cannot seek God or cry out for his help unless we're first saved and regenerated, meaning we're given the gift of faith so as we can believe and a new heart and a new mind so that we can respond. Um, and so those are kind of our, our working definitions for this. If you want to challenge these definitions or things that we're saying today, go watch episode one where we provide quotes from uh, Augustine, um, we provide uh, various quotes from Reformed Confessions. It, it's, 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 I think, pretty fair. And, and, and so I've even had um, well-known Calvinists and, and, and uh, Augustinians watch episode one, and they'll say, man, we, we're thankful for this. This is a, this is a good historical layout of, of these doctrines. Over the years, you can see how they've been consistently reformed, uh, consistently um, articulated. So um, episode one, I, I, I don't think I've had anyone who actually affirms these doctrines stand up and say that that I handled it in a um, an abusive or straw man or that I wasn't fair. So those are the definitions that we're going to go with today. 
And again, we can refer back to that. Now, I am seeing some questions here. And as this is a q and A, I want to make sure we get to at least a couple of these. So I'm scrolling through the comments. I'm, I'm looking over here. There should be a big old... Um, okay, now I'm getting back to where everybody tells me my sound is awful. <laughs> I'm getting caught back up. 5.5 five audio. All right, cool. Um, good audio. Where did I see these questions? Surely you have your questions. Um, here we go. How significant of an objection to total depravity is it that God doesn't mention it to Adam and Eve? Okay, so here we're kind of looking at, let's see. Let me bring this in here. Here we're looking at Genesis 3. Um, for some, this is going to carry a lot more weight than others because Scripture does entail some degree of a, a progressive revelation. So, you know, in Genesis 3, we get our very first um, prophecy or, or hint of a coming Messiah and Redeemer, um, but it's not clearly spelled out. It's not, you know, fine-tuned and, you know, He's going to die on a cross. He's going to have 12 apostles. He's going to walk on water. It's not, it's not that detailed. So for some, they're going to deny that this is any sort of evidence against original sin or total depravity. And they're going to say, well, you're engaging in an argument from silence. But I think, I think that falls on both camps. So we could say, well, there is no mention of it. And so if you're going to say that in Genesis 3, there's some teaching of original sin. Uh, we're going to point out that that's an argument from silence. It's not here. And then they, in turn, are going to say, well, because it's not clearly refuted, it's also an argument from silence. So, you know, if we're creating a little graph and we're going to try and give points for uh, various passages and their interpretation, Genesis 3 could be considered a wash. But we have in Genesis 3, we have... Um, in Genesis 3, we have uh, toil, we have thorns and thistles, we have um, mortality, we have expulsion from Eden, painful childbirth. We have the first uh, messianic promise in Genesis 3.15. We have legless serpents and no mention of an inherited sinful condition that all of the offspring will, will inherit. So some may see this as a wash. And if we were arguing from uh, silence and we wanted to, you know, to be awfully, um, I don't know what the word is. Uh, we may try and consider it um, a, a passage that doesn't really move the ball forward for either position, but given the severity of the claims of original sin, for me, the absence of it here seemed to be rather um, important, striking. Uh, so if we get down to um, if we get down to Genesis three fifteen, we're looking at this. Let me uh, let me back out so you guys can read that a little bit better. He says, and this is God speaking: "I will make enemies of you and the woman." and of your offspring and her descendant he shall bruise you uh he shall bruise you on the head and you shall bruise him on the heel now did adam did, did eve have any descendants without copulating with adam she did not all of us are descendants of adam and so this descendant that is being promised here the promised redeemer uh the one who's going to you know bruise the head crush the head of the serpent is a descendant of Adam and Eve. And so, you know, we can get into the doctrines of Mary's own immaculate conception or the virgin conception and the appeals to these mechanisms as a means of sparing Christ, some sort of corrupt nature. But in Genesis 3.15, we're told the Messiah is a descendant of Adam and Eve. And in the Gospels, they go out of their way to link Christ to Adam, both through Mary and uh, and his uh, stepfather, adoptive father, uh, Joseph. So um, while some may say because original sin or total depravity's consequences aren't mentioned here, 
it would be kind of uh, argument from silence from both positions. I actually believe the proto evangelum in verse 15 is a strong refutation against the claims of original sin and total depravity, because it, this is actually saying it's their descendant. And so if we're going to say that all those who were, you know, let's say, um, I'm trying to figure out a way of being not crass here. There is a view on the origin of man where we were all literally in the loins. I hope this gesture helps. Uh, we're in the loins of Adam. So all of Adam's descendants were in his loins. And this is saying, if that's the same approach, we're going to be consistent. Then we have to say the Messiah was in the loins of Adam. And so I, I really don't see this as a as a um, a starting point for original sin. I, I see this as something that is significantly uh, refuting it. Um, okay, hold on. Let's see. Now we're echoing. Somebody's saying we're echoing. Maybe maybe I'm getting uh, just some bad internet here. I'll, I will continue to go through and we'll we'll see how it's going. Uh, Romans five. Let's let's go up here to Romans five. Bear with me as I type this in. We're going to go to verse 12. <laughs> All right. And I'm going to do... I'm looking. I hate dead air, so y'all bear with me. I feel like if I'm not talking... Uh, you're not getting your money's worth here. Of course, since I'm not charging, you know, y'all all uh, can relax a little bit. <laughs> all right. So I think I think the main thing about Romans 5, verse 12, is this passage. It says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. Now, one of the things I want to note here is that this passage of Romans 5 is arguably i mean I, I don't think i don't think there's too much dispute among uh historians theologians um this was this was a this was a pivotal passage for augustine's formulation of original sin augustine did not uh read greek or hebrew all he read was the the latin translations and so there was there was two ways augustine could have read the latin and interpreted it. And one would have been more in keeping with the original text, and one would have led him down this path to conclude um, an inherited con concupiscence or, or being hereditarily guilty. Um, in the, the Hebrew and Greek, it's his interpretation just simply isn't there. So we can give Augustine the benefit of the doubt and just say that perhaps his bias and his past as a, as a Manichaean and um, his familiarity with those um, Gnostic doctrines that were going around in North Africa at the time influenced, and he thought maybe there was some similar similar parallels there. So he interpreted it in a way that was leading him to original sin. But if we look at Romans 5, let me bring this back up. Uh, the verse says that Adam, or I should say the chapter says that Adam sinned and introduced sin into the world and death came by sin. So we notice here that Adam sinned and mortality was the result, okay? Adam sinned and mortality is the result. One of the things that you'll notice is the Augustinian, in defending their anthropology, will read Romans 5, speak of sin, but they will then eisegete or assume into the text that this isn't talking about sin as in rebellion and trespasses, that you and I would commit or that Adam committed, but that this sin is an inherited sinful nature, that this is an inherited guilt. So they see the word sin in big, bold letters here. Uh, so therefore, sin entered the world, which would be rebellion and trespasses, but they read this as sinful nature and inherited guilt. Okay, so we're, are, we, are we reading what the text says or are we reading into the text? So if we just say that sin means sin, I don't think we have any problem holding a non-Augustinian anthropology. Um, I think in order to defend this passage teaching it, you have to say, oh, well, they were meaning this doctrine that isn't actually stated. They really meant sinful nature. They really meant uh, inherited guilt. 
And then what is the result of this, of this trespass? Well, it's death. Now, I could take you to Genesis 3, but um, uh, or, or just Genesis 2. But in the, in the very beginning, God tells Adam, he says, Do not eat from this tree, for in the day that you eat of it, you will surely die. Some translations will render this, in sinning you will die. But the word is the exact same. In, in Genesis, uh, when God is giving this instruction to Adam, it uses the same word for sin as the same word for death and mortality. So in dying, you shall die. In sinning, you shall die. Sin was understood to, to bring about mortality. It was a rejection of God who is life. It was a rejection of the tree of life. And so we see here, Romans is continuing this uh, uh, Jewish and, and Hebraic understanding of the anthropology of man, not introducing something new. So sin brings about mortality. So we see here that therefore, just as uh, through one man sin entered the world and death through sin, so death spread to all man, all mankind, because all sinned. So let's uh, let's continue here. Um, so they add the they add the words in Adam, right? So they they see here and they appeal to this doctrine of federal headship, and they'll they they start inter interjecting these concepts into this. Uh, well, why stop there? Why not just use the, the same Sharpie to, to write total depravity as biblical? So they're, they're adding this to the text. It's just, it's just not there. It says that uh, men sinned in different ways than Adam. Not that they inherited his guilt and sinful nature. Right? Um, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the violation committed by Adam. So it's saying like sin that you and I committed is rebellion and trespasses. Just like when Adam sinned, he committed rebellion and trespasses. So we're bringing death into our lives. So it's drawing a parallel between Adam's rebellion and our rebellion. Each one of us go through a, um, a willful rebellion, a willful rejection of God, and we choose our own way. We can get into more of these passages. I'm sure these are going to come up like Psalm 58.3, where it says, The wicked go astray. Where? If, if they're born wicked, they're they're remaining, they're persisting, they're not going astray. They're only to go astray means a deviation from a, a previous state. But uh what we see is it says that uh that men sinned in different ways than Adam, not that they inherited his guilt and sinful nature, but that they have the same consequence for sin that Adam faced, which is death. Adam condemned man to mortality. And our sin condemns us to death as well. But here's the kicker. Sin doesn't just affect us. So we're not talking about inherited guilt. But let's say that, um, let's say that there's a family driving to church one morning. And a, uh, a drunk driver drinks too much. And uh, is leaving the bar late or wherever. Leaving a party late. And he hits this family head on in their car. And everyone is killed. Now the drunk driver... He died for his own sins, and this innocent family that was driving to church that morning died for the sins of that drunk driver. They died as a consequence of his sin. They're not guilty of it, but they suffered it. And so we see here how sin brings this, uh, this suffering upon ourselves, those that we come into contact with, and it brings death. And it can affect more than just the one who is guilty. So there doesn't have to be a transmission of guilt in order for there to be a transmission of consequence and harm. Um, so it says, uh, that the condemnation Adam brought upon us was death and that Jesus brought the free gift of life and righteousness. Nothing in the text of Romans five puts forth, uh, the unique claims of, of total depravity. But then he also, um, uh, Demetar, uh, also asked for 18. So let's jump down here and look at 18 and 19. Uh, it says, uh, so then as through one offense, the result was the condemnation to all mankind. What is the condemnation that we just read about? Was it an inherited guilt? We're all guilty and deserving hell and judgment and born under the wrath of God? Or was it talking about death previously? The condemnation is mortality. This is why Christ came, lived a sinless life, suffered and died a physical death and rose again. It was to save us from 
mortality, which is the condemnation Adam brought upon mankind. Not an inherited, sinful, spiritually dead, guilty state, but mortality. So, as through the act of one righteousness, the result of justification of life to all mankind. For as through the one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So as through the obedience of the one, the many will be made righteous. And again here, we're talking about a parallel between sin equaling death and mortality. Um, one of the things that it's important to notice is that when we're talking about the incarnation, and we can get into this in like Hebrews 2 verses 14 through 18, Jesus became like us in every respect. He assumed the totality of our nature so as to redeem it by living a sinless life, suffering, dying, and raising again. So because he assumed that image and he lived perfectly and redeemed him, like rose himself up, because we share that nature, those who trust in him share in that victory as well. But he redeemed all of, all of mankind in that act. But there's a difference between being saved from death and being reconciled to God. And so as we go through scripture, you'll see that the Bible says that when the Lord returns, there's going to be a universal resurrection of all the dead, right? We've got the wicked and unrepentant over here um, who are raised to judgment, condemnation, destruction in the lake of fire. And you've got the righteous over here who have trusted in God. They have repented. Um, they've persisted in innocence. But these are the people that God has deemed worthy of salvation, whether it's by simple ignorance and his love, or if it's by an act of repentance and his mercy. And so, but all mankind experiences a bodily resurrection. And that's because Christ brought life to all mankind by living as one of us and conquering those things that would be impediments. But we still have to be reconciled to God to partake in eternal life and avoid the, uh, the, the second death, which is to come. So what we see here is, is Romans 5 is talking about mortality. It's talking about actual death. But this is, this is a, a passage that when I was coming out of Calvinism, admittedly, Romans 5 was tripping me up because I kept seeing sin, but I was understanding it to mean sinful nature and inherited guilt, total inability. And I was adding all of that baggage to a text that it's absent from. But I would say if we just let the text speak, there shouldn't be any um, any real trouble there, although maybe we might undergo some some dissidence as we're trying to deprogram from some some bad presuppositions. Um, let's see. I'm looking through here for some more question. Yeah, that was a great great question, Montrap. Um, yeah, someone was asking um, uh, about the the intro song. Uh, the song is called Shield, and I can't recall the band that uh, put it together. Everything that you hear in the intros are kind of a unique mix where I'll take the uh, instrumental track, I'll add the lyrics, I'll add some scriptural verses, I make it unique to Idol Killer. So the only place you'll hear that particular version is in my intros. Um, but um, I'll see if I can't remember the, uh, I think it's called We Are The Good. I think that's the band who made it. So shout out to them. It's pretty awesome. I don't, I don't know if they're Christian, though, so just be careful with the full lyric version. I've had some people get upset. Um, here we go. What is, what is corruption? Um, well, a, a corruption, I mean, we could, I don't, I don't know if there's a particular passage that you're, you're asking about or a particular context, you know, so sometimes we can have a generic definition and then we can have an actual application where we're supposed to draw from the surrounding text and get some sort of inference. But a corruption is a, um, a deviation. It's, it's involving error. It's bringing something in that is, that is not intended, that it's not beneficial. It's harmful. It's destructive. Um, let's see. Um, Brother Dave says, I have a question pertaining to sin. Not sure if it's on topic of original sin or total depravity, but can I ask anyway? Feel free to ask. I'll try and spot it. And if I see that it pertains, um, I'll definitely respond to it. Here we go. Uh, Psalm 58, 2 and 3. I've seen it discounted as hyper hyperbole. I know it's a psalm, 
But similar to seeing anthropomorphisms as giving insight into God, does this give insight into human nature? So guys, let's jump over <clears throat> to Psalm 58, and we're going to look at 2 and 3. So um, here we'll see. Actually, let's back up here. Look at, look at verse 1. Do you indeed speak righteousness, you gods? Do you judge fairly the sons of mankind? Now, without getting into whether this is speaking of angels or kings or principalities or um, anything along those lines, the context is clear that we're talking about judging between good and evil, right and wrong, being a fair judge. And it says, no, in your heart, you practice injustice. On the earth, you clear away for the violence of your hands. All right. So we're again, we're talking about um, violence per, uh, committed and, and perpetuated by individuals. Um, but here's where I really want us to pay attention. The wicked have turned away from the womb. Some, some translations will say they've gone astray from the womb. So what is this saying? It's not hyperbole. It's saying that they were created innocent but in committing wicked acts, they've deviated from that state of innocence. They are now guilty as a result of their own actions. They have, we mentioned this earlier, corrupted themselves by way of their own guilt, their own uh, trespasses, their own rebellion, their own sin. Those who speak lies go astray from birth. Now, they're not born speaking lies. Some translations will say that babies actually speak. But what this is saying is that they go astray and they speak lies. We'll see. Now we get into now we get into some hyperbole. So the truth is the wicked have deviated. They've departed this initial state of innocence. God created them in when he formed them in their mother's womb. And they're going astray, committing wicked acts. They have venom like the, the, the venom of a serpent, like a deaf cobra that stops up its ear. So here it's saying the wicked stop listening to truth. They stop listening to instruction. They don't care about what is good. They plug their ears so they can go their own way. It's not that they were born deaf. It's that they choose to become deaf. And so this passage, although some adherents of total depravity and original sin will claim that they were created in this state, we see from the actual text, it's teaching the exact opposite. Um, so that it does not hear the voice of the charmers or a skillful caster of spells. God shatter their teeth in their mouth. Now, is, is the author asking that God do this to all mankind? God, just knock out all of our teeth. Is, is he inviting God to knock out his own teeth? He's specifically referring to the wicked who have gone astray, have stopped listening to the rebuke of God and righteous men, and they are committing wicked acts. And God is saying, bring what? Bring the, the, the author is saying, bring judgment on the wicked. Not on mankind, but on a subset of mankind. Bring judgment on the wicked. Break out the fangs of the lo young lions, Lord. Um, may they flow away like water that runs off when he aims his arrows. May they be as headless shafts. May they be like a snail which goes along in slime. And this is disgusting like the miscarriage of a woman that never sees the sun. Before your pots can feel the fire of thorns, he will sweep them away in a whirlwind, the green and the burning alike. Now look at this. Is this saying that all mankind is righteous? No, it, it's saying that these adults who have committed themselves to honoring the Lord and following the Lord, rather than rebelling and committing individual trespasses, another subset of mankind, the righteous will rejoice when he sees vengeance. He will wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. And the people will say, certainly there is a reward for the righteous. There is certainly a God who judges on earth. So the whole context of Psalm 58 is not that we're all created guilty, sinful, wicked, but that the wicked go apart and, and, and deviate from the state they were created in. And the author is asking God to judge these men. Um, now we can get into, you know, more later on, but that's essentially the heart of Psalm 58. So anyone who's telling you that uh, that Psalm 58.3 is teaching original sin and total depravity, 
just ask them to read the whole chapter in context and say, where? It's not there. Um, okay, let's see. We're going to keep going here. Yeah, uh, so Nathan says, uh, you would think that if total depravity is such a foundational truth that it would have been mentioned uh, at least as part of the curse. And so I, I think so. I, I'm of that opinion. But what you'll find is when you're dealing with people who affirm Augustinian anthropology, they'll say, well, that's an argument from silence. So in order not to have an argument from silence, I bring them to verse 15 and I show them how Christ is a descendant of Adam and Eve. Um, let's see. If one holds to a sin nature, but not original guilt, would this be logically consistent? Oh, okay. All right. Amplified. So here's here's a fun bit, okay? In, in uh, Judaism and in the ancient Hebrew view, there's something called the Yetzer. Um, again, I have a, an episode on this in our, on, in our ongoing uh, series on original sin. But there's uh, the Yetzer. And these are the desires, the appetites, the ambition, those, those drives that God gave Adam in Eden and blessed and said we're good. And so we have uh, something called the Yetzer Hatov. And that is like when we are operating um, in the good, when these appetites are being rightly ruled and reigned. Um, they're, they're calling us to seek for wisdom and pursue truth and love. Then you have the Yetzer Hara. And the Yetzer Hara are when we surrender to these appetites. Like, it's good to hunger, but it's sinful to give over to gluttony. It's good to, to desire sexual fulfillment in marriage and have a good family, but it's wrong to give yourself over to uh, infidelity and adultery and fornication and all of this. And so when we're talking to people who use the term sin nature, it's real important that we get them to um, clarify what they mean by sin nature. Sometimes they're talking about the Yetzer Hara, appetites that if we don't rule over can lead us into sin. But that is that nature, that Yetzer isn't sinful in and of itself because God blessed it. Or they may be talking about sin nature in terms of an inherited condition we got from Adam in which it is an inconsistent application of that Augustinian anthropology. And I hope that answered your question. Um, let's see. Yeah. So Jacob says, Hey, look, uh, it doesn't actually men mention that the snake is Satan. We make that connection. Um, yeah, that's true. But Genesis three still deals with legless serpents. So, um, it still says that as a consequence for the serpent being crafty and coming in here and misleading them, God cursed him to crawl on his belly. So whether the serpent is Satan or not is I think irrelevant to the point I'm trying to make is that we have that as a consequence being clearly laid out in the, the text of the, the, the account of the fall, but no mention of an inherited sinful nature, spiritual death, guilt being created under God's wrath. None of that's mentioned. So I don't want to get into whether or not there is a connection between the serpent and Satan. Um, and, and, and serpent may actually even be um, a poetic it can mean shining one. I could, I could go off on a whole tangent about how all of the ancient cultures had uh, myths and, and legends about a serpent creature, deity-like coming and imparting wisdom. That would be a fun program, but not for today. Uh, Adam Harwood in his systematic Christian theology teaches that people are born with corruption, mortality, and a fallen world. What is meant by corruption? <clears throat> well, we're not born into an idyllic uh, state. We're not born in Eden. We're not born to parents that are free of sin. We're not born into a world free of sin. We have sin molded and taught to us uh, by our parents, even un unintentionally so. We'll witness our parents being less than honest to one another or to others. We're watching kids programs. We're going outside. We're seeing all this. So, you know, if you want to, if you want to say a corruption, I think that could be, um, it could certainly be external corruption in the sense that we're now mortal. But if we're going to say that we are created corrupt, meaning that we are somehow sinful agents um, or wicked agents, 
uh, I would have to reject that. And I've had Adam on and, and I, I love uh, Dr. Harwood. He's a, he's a uh, brilliant guy. And I think we are in far more agreement than we disagree. And I'm looking forward to getting a copy of his uh, systematic uh, theology work. And I want to bring him back on. I did an interview with him. And when I was uh, asking him questions, the, the base where he was stationed at either came under fire or nearby came under fire. And we had to cut that interview short. Um, but I need to get him back on here. Um, Josh says original death due to Adam's sin is inherited, not the sin itself. Yeah. And that's just mortality. Um, let's see. Let's see. Looking, 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 looking. Okay. No echo. Everybody's telling me we're good. Um, yeah. Mind trap says I landed the first question. Yes, you you get you get a cookie. Um if it's if it's dead air, just just hum the Flintstone song. That's right. Okay, so I am looking to um see if there's any questions here that we can get to. I'm gonna scroll through, make sure that we're caught up. Um here we go. Ezekiel 18 shows how we suffer physically for the sins of our father, but our guilt is our own sin. It's our own doing, not our father's. And that's that's great point, Nathan. Ezekiel 18, I don't know if you, uh, I, I don't think I need to turn there, but essentially it's saying that if a wicked man does, does what is wicked, but he repents and he turns and does what is right, that he'll live. And so we see here that sin and mortality are intrinsically tied. So we can sin and cut our life short. We can obey and prolong our lives. The Bible says, honor your father and mother. It'll go well with you and the days of your life will be uh, increased, right? So this kind, of, this kind of language in Ezekiel 18 not only deals with original sin, refuting it, but it also refutes this idea of a set future. We reap what we sow. So if a wicked man repents and starts doing what is right, he'll live. Though there may still be some consequence for his past sins that he has to suffer through and work out, but he'll live. If a righteous man turns from his righteous deeds and does what is wicked, the Bible says that all that he's done that is good will be forgotten and he will surely die. But it says that the, the children will not bear the iniquity. They will not be guilty for the sins of the father. And this is not some isolated, anthropomorphic, meaningless analog. This is God's standard operating procedure for how he judges. So why would he do differently in Genesis than in Ezekiel. These are both generic statements where God is showing, this is, this is what I do. Um, now, Bob is saying, does it seem that Eve had fleshly desires, comparing Genesis 3.6 to 1 John 2.16, before she had the knowledge of good and evil? Adam and Eve both had the yetzer before the fall. Yes, Adam and Eve both had the yetzer before the fall, and God declared it good and blessed it. But what we see was that Eve was not ruling over those appetites. She was listening to the devil she was, or the serpent. She was being deceived. She was looking at the, the fruit and seeing that it was attractive, you know, that it was fragrant. I mean, she's using all of her God-given senses and she's playing with rebellion. And then, then she gives herself over into it. And we're going to continue this thought. Let's, let's jump over. Let's jump over here to um, Genesis 4. Um, all right, so 6 and 7, I believe, is where it is. So um, we're all familiar with the story of Cain and Abel, I hope. If not, it's in Genesis chapter 4 versus, um, we're going to be focusing on 6 and 7, but just look at chapter 4. Um, the Lord comes to Cain. And he says, why are you angry and why is your countenance fallen or your face gloomy? If you do well, will your face not be cheerful? Will you not be happy? And if you do not do well, sin is lurking at the door and its desire is for you, but you must master it. So here God is telling Cain that, hey, what you do matters, right? Right. So if you're choosing to do what is wrong, it's not going to go well for you. If you choose to do what's right, you're going to be blessed. But he goes on to say that sin is lurking at the door. This is an idiom 
meaning that sin is outside seeking an opportunity to come in. And he's saying, hey, don't crack that door, Cain. Don't let sin in. Its desire is contrary for you. It wants to rule over you, but you keep that door shut. You master it. Now, if you're holding on to an Augustinian anthropology, you have to say, well, why are you lying to Cain, Lord? There is no sense in which God could tell Cain this and be truthful. Not with an Augustinian anthropology. But if we understand it from you know, a biblical anthropology, I would argue, the ancient Hebrews and um, even to some extent the Eastern Orthodox or Anabaptists, we would see that, that uh, God is basically saying, Cain, you're angry. You're about to give place to sin. It's seeking an opportunity over you. This, this, you're about to surrender to these desires. I gave you good desires and you're not ruling over them. You're about to give yourself over to death, right? And Cain's sin brought death upon whom? Upon Abel. And then it brought suffering upon Cain and even his progeny. It brought suffering upon their parents. Adam and Eve had to grieve and mourn the loss of a child because Cain would not rule over his sin. And yet he could have. So um, I think that's uh, definitely worth noting. Um, Jesus, or, uh, Adam, or excuse me, Nathan, eventually I'm going to get it. Nathan says, all men have the Yetzer, and what we do with the Yetzer determines if it's good or evil. That's right. If When we respond uh, beneficially, it's the Yetzer Hatov. When we give ourselves over to corruption and uh, destruction and death, we're entering into the Yetzer Hara. Uh, Jesus had the Yetzer, which he does describe. He says, I have earnestly desired you know, Jesus is talking about his own yetzer in the New Testament. But God, uh, but 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 he chose good where we choose evil. So if we say that the yetzer is, these desires are inherently evil, then when Jesus speaks of his yetzer, we're saying he had evil desire. It doesn't, it doesn't make sense. We look at the context of the passage and we see that the yetzer can be abused or it can be ruled over. Um, here we go. Um I'm not sure how to pronounce that. B Bjorn or, or Biom. I can't tell if that's an RN or an M. Inherited guilt is a strictly Latin Western Christian concept. The Eastern Church has never accepted it. They also never accepted infant damnation, unlike the West. Great point. So, you know, we 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 can get into, if you want to, we can actually get into the origin of how Augustinian anthropology became quote unquote orthodox. Um among uh, the state church at Rome and why those in Constantinople did not uh, get so easily corrupted by it. The, uh, the, the, the topic of that's fascinating. I have a, um, an interview. I have an interview on the, the channel here with Dr. Ali Bonner, um, which is fascinating. She has a book called the myth of Pelagianism. And um, it really starts to shed some light on a lot of these issues. And there's a lot more scholarly work coming out now that's shining even more light on these issues. But original sin um, was rejected. Augustinian anthropology was rejected by Pope Zosimus. Pelagius was declared orthodox in front of several church assemblies while rejecting Augustine's anthropology. But Augustine appealed to this secular, non-Christian emperor, Emperor Honorius, and said, hey, look, this Christian infighting is going to rip your empire apart, and you're over here fighting these Germanic tribes. Let's, uh, you know, we need your help here, emperor. We're, we're looking to you. And the emperor came in and said, oh, all these claims of Augustine against Pelagius, I don't care about that. Original sin, inherited guilt, that's orthodoxy. And you see Pope Zosimus go, oh, yep, you're right. And Pope Zosimus was called out by it by several people who they then turned around and had excommunicated. And it was it was a big controversial issue. But we see how original sin became the quote unquote orthodox view of the, the Western church. And it was because of political power from a secular emperor, not how uh, doctrine is to be determined uh, to be valid or not. Um, right on, idol killer. Uh, the consequences versus penalties distinction. Yeah. Um, see, I'm looking, 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 looking. Um, here we go. So Nathan talks about the gift of grace comes to the same men um, 
who judgment came to and led to condemnation, but just uh, as one must sin to receive condemnation, we must receive faith by the gift in order to result in life. What's interesting is in, uh, in Augustine's view, prior to him, there was all these different manifestations of God's grace in the life of men, believers or unbelievers alike. God is a gracious God. So there was all these ways where they would talk about God's grace here and God's grace there. And by God's grace, I'll do this. Or by God's grace, I'll be spared from that. Or, you know, in this or that. But Augustine came in and he really redefined it in a singular term of effectual, prevenient grace that is the switch that counteracts this inherited concupiscence. It's kind of the pre-faith regeneration that, you know, it's this, it's this enabling grace that God gives us so we can overcome the state that he had cursed us all to be with. It, when you're in the system, you go, okay, that kind of makes sense. And then once you come out of it, you're like, what was I thinking? That just, it's so silly. But if you think that's part of Christianity and you, you're a believer, you go, well, I love the Lord and this is part of it. I guess I'm going to have to accept it. I'm not going to pay too much attention to that. I'm going to appeal to mystery. When I stand before him, we'll get it all sorted out. So I'm just going to not look over here because I'm kind of scared. I want to be a Christian, but I don't want to consider this doctrine could be wrong because it's Christianity, right? It's foundational. If original sin isn't true, then why did Jesus come? Oh, no, my faith is starting to be undone. So a lot of times we let this fear and this distrust of God's word keep us in doctrines that we shouldn't be adhering to. And if we stopped and we actually considered it like good Bereans, we'd be set free from some really bad ideas. Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. So do we trust him or do we not? We can, we can look into all these things and, and, and do so without fear. We, can, we need to be good stewards. We need to have discernment. We need to make sure that we're considering all the angles and we're prayerfully engaging in these exercises. But uh, we can pursue truth because we believe in Christ. Hey, Travis, thank you for, uh, for coming in here and, and joining me in this. I, I appreciate it. It's a treat that you're here. Um. Yeah. Okay. Nathan, man, with some good nuggets here. Something to note, the receiving in verses 16 and 17 is active in the Greek. We actively receive the gift by faith. That's right. So it is, it, it's a living faith. It's, it's not stagnant. It's not a one-time mental ascent, but it's a, a committed relationship, committed pursuit, committed remaining, committed abiding. Um, let's keep looking here. Let's go. Um, looking for the questions. <laughs> yeah, the deprogramming is real. It it hurts. My head ached. My heart broke. And I was like, oh, no, am I going to survive this? Is my faith going to survive it? Um, so I get it. Um, hey, Randall, I love you too, brother. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, here we go. Here's a question. BJ says, can John 5, 24 through 25 refute the Calvinist doctrine of total depravity? The statement that dead people cannot respond to the gospel. All right, well, let's jump up here and uh, and look here real quick. I just did Romans. Pulling this up right now. Here we go. So he said uh, 24 and 25. Truly, truly, I say to you, the one who hears my word and believes him. So we see a response. God initiating. Did he give that word just to you or did he give it to all men? So we see God, his teaching, his, his word, his call. And the one who believes him uh, who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death and into life. Why? We're not passing out of spiritual death because we're able to hear and respond. We're passing out of mortality because Christ is going to conquer the hold of the grave and promise eternal physical life for all of us. Christianity doesn't, uh, let me, let me, um, I'll come back to that. Christianity does not teach that our ultimate aim is to be a bunch of ethereal spirits floating around on clouds. Christianity is the culmination of, of Hebraic thought, Hebraic practice. It's it's accepting the Hebraic Messiah. It's accepting the Jewish Messiah. And in Judaism and the ancient Hebrews, 
God created mankind to rule and reign in a physical creation in his stead. He created us to have bodies. He created a physical world. We're not, we're not uh, Gnostics. We believe that God loved and created and designed a physical reality for us to enjoy. And so where our, our beliefs are that God is ultimately going to return, resurrect everyone, restore everything, a new heaven and a new earth, new bodies, but in a physical sense that, that there's, there's, there's actual substance for our existence, um, that we're not just some ethereal spirit trying to escape this material plane and ascend to a more uh, nirvana-like state of, of spiritual enlightenment but that God uh, loves us and that he's coming in a physical sense to rule and reign with us for eternity. Um, so it, it is a, it is a tangible faith. It's a tangible kingdom. It's a tangible thing that we look forward to. Anyway, moving on, getting back to verse 25, truly, truly, I say to you, a time is coming and even now has arrived when the dead will hear the voice of the son of God and those who hear will live. For just as the Father has life in himself, so he gave the Son also to have life in himself. And we see a continued of thought. And he gave him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all the tombs will hear his voice and will come out. Those who did the good deeds to a resurrection of life and those who committed the bad deeds to a resurrection of judgment. Just like I was mentioning earlier, we're expecting a bodily resurrection when Jesus returns and we're all raised bodily. The wicked are raised over here for judgment, condemnation. Um, their knee will bow, their tongue will confess. And then over here we have the faithful, the innocent, the redeemed, the, those trusting in him, uh, the righteous and so this is speaking of a physical death, a physical resurrection to life. But often those who hold to an Augustinian anthropology will say, no, no, this is a spiritual death. Tombs is just a metaphor for your body and that soul inside your dead body. Well, wait a minute. Didn't you say that the spirit is also dead? There's some disconnect here. Um. Hey, thanks for that, Melissa. I, uh, I put a lot of thought into these and I like it to be uh, entertaining and engaging while you guys are waiting for the program to, um, to begin. Yeah, so did the flesh and reap corruption, right? So instead of just being hungry and eating healthy, we give ourselves over to the gluttony. We have high blood pressure. We have cardiovascular disease. We have liver problems. We have uh, obesity. We have uh, strokes and heart attacks and all sorts of things. Um, we can sow to the flesh and engage in fulfilling our sexual appetites and reap every manner of disease and ailment until um, we get pretty pretty disgusting. And so it's not just a, a, a spiritual corruption, but it is a, it's a death to the body. Um, hey, thanks for that, Mind Trap. Uh, that, that's pretty cool. Um, Let's see, looking here, going through. I'm looking through here. Ah, Jordan, thank you for bringing this up. This is fun. So we're going to jump over to Psalm 22. Um, where is it? Is it 9 and 10? Yeah, here we go. Um. Yet you are he who brought me forth from the womb. You made me trust when upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon you from birth. You have been my God from my mother's womb. So when we see passages actually talking about the initial state of man in, in, in utero, it's never in the sense of being spiritually dead, wicked, and guilty. It's always the state of innocence, Real innocent, rely, ignorant reliance upon God, like simple reliance, simple fidelity, simple trust, right? Innocence. But then when it talks about the wicked, it's departing that state. Um, and a lot of people miss this. And they'll say, oh, that's Pelagian. No, that's Christian orthodoxy. Augustine is not orthodox. Um, 
You know, I mean, maybe in the West, they're going to call him a doctor of the church and they're going to revere him. Um, the man, let's, let's look at this. Let me, let me just, um, let's look right here. Let's look right here. Paul, in writing Acts chapter 20, says in verse 28, Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after them. Therefore, be on the alert, remembering that day and night, and for a period of three years, I did not cease to admonish each one with tears. So here we see the apostle warning us that after he leaves, after he departs, after he dies, there's going to be people that arise from within the so-called body of believers to deceive, to mislead, and to teach perverse things. And we know that this idea of original sin was not Jew Jewish. It's not something Paul would have learned at the feet of uh, uh, Galil. Gal I can't pronounce his, his mentor. Galil? Gam Gamil? Anyway, you know who I'm talking about. Uh, he, he, it's not something he would have learned at the feet of his mentors. This is not a Jewish concept. This is a Gnostic idea. When, when they said that the spirit of Antichrist, um, which is coming and is now in the world already, that was referring to Gnosticism. It was referring to this uh, idea that the, the material world is inherently corrupt. And because that would deny the actual biblical incarnation and redemptive work of Christ. And so uh, we've got to be careful here. Now, let's jump over here. Um, how would you define nature, Warren? Also, how would you define the image of God? Thanks for all the great content. Man, nature, huh? There's, there's two, two senses that I would say immediately that I would recognize. One is the state in, of, of just those things that are essential to our being uh, that we're created with. You know, like we have flesh, soul, intellect, emotion, heart. Like as, as human beings, those things that are shared among all of us, that, that's kind of like our, our nature, right? But then we can also develop a nature. Like Michael Jordan was a natural athlete. And he practiced thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of hours to become a natural uh, basketball player. So it might, we might say, well, he was tall. Yeah, he was tall. That doesn't mean he's great at basketball. It was the fact that he had dedicated himself. He had practiced these things that made him a natural athlete. So we could look at like uh, Ephesians uh, 2. And you're going to see, um, you know, actually, let's let's do that. I've got a video on this. Um Oh, I did Ephesians 22. That's wrong. Let's look at this and we'll, we'll consider one sense in which nature can be understood. And you were dead in your offenses and sins in which you previously walked. Do we notice that right off the bat? It doesn't say in which you were previously created or you were created in, but it's talking about a manner in which you practice something that you're doing. According to the course of this world, According to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of Adam. No, the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all previously lived in the lusts of our flesh, meaning they had given themselves over to gratifying the appetites of the body. They were disobedient when they acted upon the Yetzer Hara in a non-profitable manner. Indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were what? By nature, children of wrath, just as the rest. Now the Augustinian goes, oh, nature, children, wrath. God hates babies. We win. But if you look at the context, you see that it was something that you went astray, as Psalm tells us. This isn't at odds with Psalm 58.3. It isn't at odds with the rest of Scripture. You're created innocent. You go astray. You commit sins and trespasses like the prodigal son who departed his father's estate. And the father said, my son who was dead when the son repented and came back is now alive again. So this is talking about a 
uh, it's like a Hebrew idiom. So death can refer to mortality, and it can also refer to the relationship we have with God, meaning if we don't turn, death is inevitable. Destruction, the second death, is inevitable. But you were dead in the offenses and sins in which you previously walked according to the course of this world. You're practicing, you're reaping, you're developing a nature in bondage to sin. And you've given yourselves over to fulfilling this appetite. But it, this isn't something that, you know, oh, the we were children of wrath, meaning when, when you read about the, the children of wrath, this is saying that you're cultivating. It's like you're, you're giving yourselves over. You're saying, I'm rejecting this natural um, uh, affiliation with God, and I'm cultivating wrath. It talks about like swelling and all this, reaping. Um, but God being rich in mercy... Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our wrongdoings, made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Again, talking about Christ assuming the totality of the human nature and being raised up and restored, restoring that icon, exalting us in him because he took up our nature with him. Um. So that in the ages to come, he might show the boundless riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this, referring to the salvation, is not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not a result of work so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would all walk in them. So this is about restoring mankind to God's initial purpose of being image bearers in his likeness, emulating him. So this is a, this is talking about the restorative work of Christ and how God will forgive us for cultivating sin. He'll forgive us for our wickedness and rebellion. As in Ezekiel 18, it tells us we can a wicked man can turn, do what is right, and live. So um, there's another there's another passage too, and I can't recall it, um, but it says. Um, uh, little children, I think it's John, is it John 4? Oh, is it 1 John 4? Um, I think it might be 1 John 4. Somewhere here. Uh, little children, where is it? Uh, I can't, I can't find it off the top of my head, but... God says, uh, let no one deceive you. Whoever does what is right is righteous, even as he is righteous. But everyone who makes a practice of sinning uh, is of the devil. And so we see this whole concept of sowing and reaping, sowing and reaping. You know, right now you may be reaping wrath. You may be planting corn. Don't expect to grow uh, squash if you're planting corn. You're going to reap what you've sown. You may be sowing wrath. You may be sowing death, destruction. You're going to reap that. But you can stop, you can repent, and you can start sowing life and righteousness and trust and fidelity and uh, and repent, and God is gracious and he'll forgive us. One thing while we're on that topic of biblical repentance, let's jump over to Isaiah 55. <clears throat> this is one of my favorite um, passages in all of Scripture. I see it as a, a wonderful thing, and I also see it as contrary to Augustinian anthropology it says, seek the Lord while he may be found and call upon him while he is near. Let and, and, and seek the Lord while he may be found. Total inability, guys. This is completely contrary. If you're saying that this is addressed to all mankind, and we're going to see that it is because it deals with the wicked. It says, seek, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he's near. Total depravity, total inability says that we can't. So here we would have God again taunting all of mankind saying, do this thing that I know I've created you incapable of doing. And if you do this thing I've created you incapable of doing, then I'll reward you. But that's not the, that's not the heart of God. He's not, <clears throat> he's, not, he's not lying to us. We can trust his self-revelation. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Listen to this. Let the wicked abandon his way and the unrighteous person his thoughts. And let him return to the Lord, and he will have compassion on him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. So we see here how God calls all men to repent. And he says, don't get in the wicked's way. Let them come to me. 
I will pardon them. This is the this is the the justice of God on display. God is contrary to many Protestant models of the atonement. God is just to forgive. Right, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. God is just to forgive. And yet, some of our atonement theories today that stem from the the Reformation era would have us believe that uh, God would be unjust were He simply to forgive us. <clears throat> Let me get a sip of water here real quick. Mm. So 2 Kings 21, 16 says, Manasseh shed much innocent blood. Yeah, we're supposed to believe that innocent is guilty blood. Yeah, there's there's all throughout scripture. It talks about, <clears throat> about the innocent. Um, let's see. Yeah, Nathan says Jesus was clearly a descendant of Adam. Absolutely. If Jesus was born of a woman, born of a man, by genetic definition, he would be of Adam even without the addition of male DNA via normal reproduction. Yeah, I mean, what, what you'll get into, and I have a video on this in that series on uh, Mary's Immaculate Conception, which says that God, in a singular act of grace and privilege, spared Mary when she was in her mother's womb. He created her without the stain of original sin, without concupiscence. So that then she could be a pure vessel that the Holy Spirit could then enter into, impregnate, and bring forth the Messiah. Um, and then in order to say, well, wait a minute, why did Mary need a Redeemer? Then they, they go through all this preservative redemption. And they, they start inventing more doctrine to counteract an Antichrist belief. You know, um, There's been a lot of talk about Roman Catholicism um, in the, the, the news lately because of a certain... Uh, Christian's conversion. And in Protestant circles, you know, there's been this long held belief that, you know, that the Pope or one of the eventual popes would be a, like a false prophet or an antichrist. But I think what you see in scripture is anyone that holds a doctrine that is in opposition to the truth of Christ is antichrist. Any doctrine that denies the actual biblical incarnation, which says in Hebrews 2, 14 through 18, that he came in our flesh and blood like us in every respect, um, then you're, you're denying the, the fundamental work of Christ. And so it's it's antichrist. And so if, if, if you're a Roman Catholic and you're holding to this Augustinian view of original sin, I'm not saying you are an antichrist. I'm not saying you are denying Christ. But I'm saying a doctrine you affirm is that, is that tension. It's an odds with your affirmation of Christ. So at some point, you're going to have to choose. You know, do I believe in the biblical incarnation of Christ or am I going to affirm this Augustinian anthropology that's at odds with that? And the same thing's true for Protestants. I'm not just picking on, on Catholics. If you're going to hold this, these two doctrines that are clearly in tension, you're going to either affirm them in principle but follow Christ in practice or you're going to affirm them in practice and deny Christ. Um, it's a double-minded man. You can't serve two masters. And we don't know we're doing it. I'm not saying this is a salvational issue where... You know, I mean, uh, was it was it uh, Peter uh, where Christ told him, get behind me, Satan? And it was because he was operating in a mindset that was contrary to the ministry and work of Christ. And Peter loved Jesus and Jesus loves Peter. And we see that when Peter realized this and Jesus appeared to him, he says, do you love me? Then feed my sheep. And he rubbed it in. Jesus rubbed it in. Do you love me? He was making it a point. Do you love me or do you love what you want me to be? Right. And so sometimes we just have to say, you know what? I was wrong about my expectations of you. I want the real genuine article. Um, but again, like I, I don't, I don't kick um, uh, Catholics or Protestants out of the kingdom. Um, <clears throat> I don't kick Eastern Orthodox or Anabaptists out of the kingdom. Uh, I think if you sit back and you make this about a mental ascent to a sort of certain set of propositions then you're saying salvation is like an old Scantron test that we would take in, in school. It's not about a relationship with God. It's not about theosis and this walk with God and, and, um, and being transformed into his image. So I'm not in any position to kick anyone out of the kingdom. I just want to challenge you on your doctrines. I hope that comes across. Now, this is fun. Um, <clears throat> Augustine viewed sex between even believers as something done in shameful lust and therefore sinful. So any result from that would be sinful. And that's true. We have his writings. 
And in his writings, Augustine said that when married couples engage in sex for pleasure, that this is worse than engaging in relations with a prostitute. That was Augustine's work. He believed that you should only copulate um, with in, without any passion or desire and solely for reproductive benefit. It was, it was kind of this whole idea of stoicism um, and, and the, the thoughts that were going around in that North African view at the time. And when he converted, he, he, was, a, he was a bit of a player. I mean, he had a concubine, a 15-year-old son. <clears throat> he sent his concubine away so he could engage a, an 11-year-old and marry into um, a more affluent family. And he sent her away, I want to say a year before they were to be wed, because he had converted to Christianity. And in that era, there was a very strong movement against sex, even in marriage. Very strong. Such that I believe it was Jerome who had a an early Protestant, not in the reform sense, but protesting the, the state church, uh, monk uh, beat to death because he was saying that there was a place in the body of Christ for not only the virgin, but the widowed and the married. And um, that individual was was beaten to death um, by most accounts. Other, the other accounts, he just simply disappeared. So it's, it's not good. Um, <clears throat> looking through here. Um, yeah, so here we go, Jew and Creek. Hey buddy, uh, Rod, how are you doing, sir? Uh, he says, I've always believed in original sin because that's what I was taught, but I'm open to another viewpoint if I see it in scripture. And I think that's entirely reasonable, you know? Um, nobody starts over as a blank slate and just goes, ah, um, you know, this is what my entire worldview is. I'm just going to completely set it aside. Um, I think I was a bit of an odd duck because I was reading scripture and I was like, wait a minute, I, I don't believe this. This is contrary to what I believe. And so just through an exercise of trusting in Christ, I said, you know, I'm going to set all this aside. I'm going to assume Christ is the word, took on flesh, suffered, died, rose again. Um, and he's the only way. I mean, that's my kind of foundational starting point. But all these other doctrines, I'm going to set aside. And I'm going to investigate every other potential op uh, option or view and see which one seems to be most in keeping with Scripture. And I didn't start by working my way back. So I could say, oh, well, I believe this, and Charles Hodge in 1873 believed it, and then you know John Calvin, Martin Luther, going all the way back to Augustine. Because eventually you go back far enough, and you can kind of see some, some, some lines going back, and you go, okay, well, that justifies that I'm on target. What I did was I went back to Genesis, and I worked my way forward, and I said, we're, we're on path, we're on path, we're on path. And then you get to Augustine, and you see a major detour occurring. Um, so that's kind of how I arrived there. But I would just say, hey, consider the options. Watch that original sin series. Consider it. Um, I still have to do one on Romans 5. Still have to do one on Psalm 51.5. Um, but uh, speaking of that, BJ says, might as well go over Psalm 51. All right, let's do that real quick. Let me pull that up. Um I'm looking. What just happened? No. Cancel. Let's see. Here we go. I pulled up some of my notes just to kind of refresh my memory. So Psalm 51. Um, a few things about this passage. This is set within the context of 2 Samuel, where David has been confronted for his adultery with Bathsheba and the murder of her husband, Uriah. He's been told by the prophet that God has forgiven him, but his infant son will die. David then begins pleading with the Lord, fasting and praying, interceding for his son and asking God to save his son from the consequences of David's sin. Not the guilt, but the consequence. When this infant or this young child dies, David declares his child's innocence in 2 Samuel. I think it's uh, chapter 12. I might pull that up here in a minute. But he declares his, his child's innocence 
and states that he is confident the child went to be with the Lord because he says, knowing that God forgave him, David says, he can't come to me, but I can go to him. And so it was during this time of fasting and prayer that Psalm 51 is set, where he's in, he's basically um, pleading with God to forgive him of his, of his adultery, of his murder, and to spare his child. And he's recalling all of his sins, those sins which led to Bathsheba becoming pregnant. He recalls his own mother's sin and how she became pregnant with him. And he's essentially telling God, you know, reminding God, you spared me despite my parents' sin. Please do the same for my child. There's not a single mention in this passage of, of Psalm 51 that David was created spiritually dead or guilty or sinful. Rather, in the Hebrew, we see a word, yaham. Now, yaham, we talk about um, conceived. Let's see here. Uh, Psalm 51, 5. Um, so this word for conceived in Psalm 51, 5 is yaham. And it's it's used to speak of animals in heat mating. Like a like the, the the bulls and the cows or the birds, oxen, wildlife, in that primal kind of yetzer hara, um, baser instinct of just rut. You know, uh, we might use um, other language today, and and um, but uh, she was burning with passion. Let's just say, and so David is choosing this word for conception that des that describes animals in heat mating. The only time this word is used in scripture to describe humans mating is right here. So the poet king, David, is very intentionally linking his own conception in, in his mother's womb, that act that conceived him, with animals in heat rutting around. So he says, behold, I was brought forth in, and the Hebrew word here uh, can be understood to be uh, shame from being exposed, like the shame of being pregnant and given birth. That's kind of a vulnerable state for women. Um, it's also um, uh, used to describe the pain of childbirth. So if you do a word study, I'll, I'll go into more detail on this in my actual original sin series when I actually get around to doing it. Psalm 51.5 is probably going to be my longest episode yet, which is why I keep delaying it and keep telling myself I'll get around to it. But when he says, I was brought forth in guilt, that word has connotations to shame and pain. And oddly enough, in Genesis 3, what was a consequence for Adam and Eve's sin, but painful childbirth. So we actually see that this is describing the pain of, of being born and the, the shame of being so exposed. And in sin, my mother conceived me. So if we actually look at the Hebrew and we try to derive what is being expressed in kind of an English maybe dynamic equivalent, we would read that he's saying, look and see, my mother conceived me in sinful passion like an animal in heat and gave birth to me in pain. There is nothing here that would describe in the Hebrew anywhere an imputed or inherited guilt, sinful nature, spiritual death, none of the connotations, inability, right? Right? And so one of the ways that I like to challenge people to think about this pas passage is if I said, behold, I was brought forth uh, in guilt and in a Ford Taurus, my mother conceived me. Well, we're talking about the, con the, the, the setting of that conception. No one would say that if David was conceived in a Ford Taurus, that he has the, uh, the nature of a four-door sedan. But that's the way that adherents of Augustinian anthropology read into this. Oh, he was conceived in sin, meaning either because of the sinful act of his mother conceiving him, he's guilty of that, which is completely contrary to like passages like Ezekiel, which we've looked at, or God took sin when he was knitting David together in the mother's womb and wove in this sin nature. Neither one of these concepts is actually found in the text. Um, but a lot of times you'll hear this um, being expressed as, as teaching um, total depravity or original sin. And um, 
you know, one of the things that's kind of interesting here is like we could go up and we could look at, um, oh, where is it? it talks about hyssop. Um, sorry. Oh, here we go. Purify me with hyssop and I will be clean. So are we talking about original sin and total depravity, some inherited sinful nature and guilt? Well, then all we got to do is wipe some hyssop on a baby and boom, they're saved, right? Who's teaching that in the churches these days? Oh, well, baptism replaced that, Warren. Oh, did it? We just wash away the original sin? That's kind of how they have to handle these passages very, very loosely. Cleanse me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sin and wipe out all my guilty deeds. He's not saying hide your face from my inherited sin and wipe out all my ancestors' deeds that I'm guilty of. He's taking personal accountability for the adultery he committed with Bathsheba, the murder of Uriah, and that consequence of those sins is now impacting his innocent child, who, as I said in um, 2 Samuel, he actually identifies as innocent. Um, but there's a lot more I could go into, a lot, lot, lot more for Psalm 51. Um, yeah, everyone loves Psalm 51, but um, it does not teach original sin and total depravity. Jordan says, we need some scholarly voices of reason over Psalm 51. I can't imagine many scholars or any really. Um, yeah, I think, I think I just saw something from Michael Heiser on Psalm 51 recently, and uh, he's come out against it. He, he, he's, he's still kind of continuing his study of um, anthropology, biblical anthropology, but you see that he's really moving away from this Augustinian paradigm. Um, I would put Michael somewhere probably in the Baptist camp of like no inherited guilt, but maybe like, you know, some random unstated sinful nature that's, that's that they're created with. But I think if he continues, he'll, he'll see it's more of like a yet, sir. Um, uh, we're asked here, Adam and Eve were created with desires to have free will. We need to have, uh, have desires. Yeah, and, and we need to have conflicting, you know, we can have conflicting desires. Like, I want to go eat uh, some uh, cheesecake, and I also would love to lose some weight. So, you know, am I going to have a smaller slice of cheesecake? That's an option. Or no cheesecake? Or just say, oh, you know, my New Year's resolution, I'll start on January 1. <laughs> I'm confessing my struggles to all of you. This, this beard is hiding a, a rather robust, rotund face here. Um, here we go. Nathan says, I had a former Catholic in my church who said they didn't believe that infant baptism was about original sin, but more of like a dedication. It depends on what what flavor of Catholic you're dealing with. Um, you know, like I was talking to Father Panayotis, uh, who's Eastern Orthodox, and he said it's more of an introduction into the church and um, giving this child the Holy Spirit to aid them as they grow and, and sanctify them over time. And hopefully they'll, you know, remain in the faith. So they have a bit of a unique view of it in the East. Um, but uh, if they're strict Augustinian in their practice, it is washing away that stain of sin. And uh, as a matter of fact, you had, um, was it Fulgen Fulgentius, I believe it was. And I addressed this in my episode on infant damnation, but Fulgentius, I believe that was who it was was saying, look, any baby, whether in utero or dies shortly after that hasn't been baptized, like they're roasting in the, the pit of hell. And um, was it Jonathan Edwards? I believe it was Jonathan Edwards who said that um, it was most just, exceedingly just, you know, that God would do this. So um, does that describe the heart of God who loved us while we were his enemies and took on sinful nature, went through a, a woman's birth canal to be born, covered in the filth of birth. I mean, that was such an impediment to the Gnostics. They had to deny this. And that he suffered and laid down his life because of his great love for us. It just, it doesn't connect. I can't imagine. Jesus says, suffer not the little children to come unto me. 
and anyone who causes them to stumble, it would be better for a millstone to be tied about their neck and thrown into the sea. Well, what's that about if they're created spiritually dead? What he's saying is, is don't corrupt the innocent. Don't keep them from me. Don't teach them things that would bar them from trusting in me as I intended for them to do. You know, and that requires a deviation. That requires going astray into wickedness. Um, yeah, so Josh says, could I mention that uh, Augustine thought that Jesus had a pre-fallen Adamic uh, flesh that passed through Mary as water through a pipe? Yeah, so essentially the idea is that Jesus assumed a pre-fall nature that we call him the second Adam, not because of what he accomplished, but that he was essentially created um, ex nihilo out of uh, maybe out of the, out of the dust. Right. So, so they would say that Jesus is created um, the, the, the fleshly part of Christ, not that the word was created. They're not going to commit that heresy, but they're going to say that um, the body of Christ, the nature of Christ was like Adam before he sinned, right? And that completely rejects all of the early church's redemptive theories on Christ having to assume our flesh and nature, as we read in First John four. Um, let me let me actually let me pull that up while we're talking about this because I don't know if I read this yet. Um, No, it wasn't for, was it? I don't think it was for John. Mm. Was it? No, it's Hebrews. What am I doing? Hebrews 2. Sorry. Sorry about this. Um, here we go. So we see here it says, Since therefore the children share in flesh and blood, he himself likewise all, also partook of the same. So he is sharing in the same flesh and blood that you and I have. That through death he might destroy the one who has power of death, that is the devil. So we see here that Christ assuming the totality of human nature is essential to his work and ministry. Not a pre-fall nature, but like us. He shared in what we have. It doesn't say he shared in Adam pre-fall. He says he was like us. Uh, so that he might, through death, destroy the one who has power of death, that is the devil, and free those who, through fear of death, were subject to slavery, or we might say futility, all their lives. For clearly he does not give help to angels. So this isn't some sort of deistic, um, donatist, Gnostic sort of view of you know just him appearing in a spiritual, uncorrupt sort of nature, but he took on our nature. And what does it say? He gives help to the descendants of Abraham. Now, somebody would say, oh, that's just the spiritual children of Abraham. That's not the fleshly children of Abraham. Well, it says, therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brothers. Right? In all things, in every respect, in all things. This is the totality of human nature that you and I have, Christ assumes, so that he could heal it. Adam, before the fall, needed no healing. Adam, before the fall, needed no redemptive work. He needed no deliverance. That accomplishes nothing, right? But Jesus assumed that broken image and restored it so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in things pertaining to God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. For since he himself was tempted, now this is tripping up a lot of people. Oh, he was just superficially tempted. Why did he pray that the cup might pass? Why did he sweat drops of blood? Right? In that which he suffered, he's able to come to the aid of those who are tempted. Right? We see here that Jesus was like us in every respect, not Adam. Uh, but this is, a, this is a key distinction between the Bible and Augustinian anthropology. Um, here we go. When you have the truth hidden from you and you're told just to accept it and not question it, you're most likely in a cult. Yeah. You know, what you end up with is a, is a case of the blind leading the blind. And um, if you sit at the feet of false teachers, don't expect to get, you know, a lot of truth from it. And we repeat these mistakes. 
you know, um, I'm not, I'm not anti discipleship. I think that's really important, but somewhere along the way, the state church in Rome through Augustine and all the political machinations that were going on there brought in corruption and it perpetuates corruption to this day. doesn't mean everyone who's a part of that isn't saved. I'm not saying that, but doctrinally in our understanding of God is, is, um, jeopardized because of these, because of these beliefs. Um, here we go. Thanks for answering my question earlier. Did the knowledge of good and evil play any part in our desires other than maybe shame for Adam and Eve? So I, I hold the view kind of like the, the early church held. Um, I know many in the East will hold this view, but I believe that ultimately God intended for Adam to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but it just wasn't in season, so to speak. Like Adam was not mature, capable, receptive, uh, God doesn't create anything that is bad. Uh, sometimes he'll have a blessing for us, but we're not capable or mature enough to receive it yet. You know, you don't want to go and eat um, an orange before it's ripened, right? Bitter fruit. And um, in this case, I believe that had Adam and Eve trusted in God, rebuked the serpent, then they would have seen God judge the serpent and they would have eaten from the tree of life metaphorically by way of obedience and surrender. Um, so I, I think that ultimately God intended for that, because one of the things you'll notice in Genesis three, when Adam does indeed eat from the tree, God says, behold, the man has become more like one of us, which was God's purpose from the beginning, because he said, let's create man in our image and likeness. So I don't think that we can draw from the text that ultimately forever, there was a prohibition against this tree. And I don't think God put it there as an act of temptation but as a mechanism to, to establish their free choice and obedience, to create gen, an opportunity and an environment for genuine love and fidelity, and that had they acted in genuine love and fidelity, um, they would eventually be able to eat from it. Um, so one of the things that we know is that Christ is described as the tree of life, and we're told that when he returns that we'll eat metaphorically from that tree, and in doing so, we will have eaten from the tree through what Adam and we'll have eaten through the other tree through Christ. And so you have creatures that ultimately God has restored to his intended purpose, but there was a significant several thousand year delay and detour because of sin. That's my take on it in a nutshell. Yes. Jordan says there is a sin nature in the Bible. But one developed through habit. Um, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he, that sort of thing. No, I have not, I have not mentioned this in Truth by Grace. Um, but Genesis 8.21, all right? Now, in Genesis 8.21, let me uh, let me pull this up just to answer any questions you guys may have about this. Um, so when I was when I was coming out of Calvinism and I was reading my Bible and I saw total depravity at odds. I didn't see it in Genesis 3. I saw it refuted in Genesis 4. I get to Genesis 6, 5, and I'm like, kind of, no, shoot. I get to Genesis 8, 21, and I'm like, yes, total depravity right here. The Lord smelled the soothing aroma, and the Lord said to himself, I will never again curse the ground, right? doesn't say he'll curse man in Genesis 3. This is a re reference to that God cursed the ground on the account of man. For the intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. I will never again destroy every living thing as I have done. And they'll say, look right here, Warren. The intent of man's heart is evil from his youth. And when I saw that as a, as a Calvinist, I go, hooray, I'm done. And I went to turn the page or, or close the, the Bible. And I was like, wait a minute. Youth doesn't say conception. What is this Hebrew word for youth? And if you go and do a word study, let's see. See if I can find this. Let me, uh, Genesis 8, 21. Mm -hmm. Let me uh, pull this up here real quick. Stop screen, present. Here we go. We remove that so he can read it better. So uh, if we go down here, 
skip and trying to find a specific word I want to draw your attention to. Here we go. So we're talking about youth, right? And we see this word is naur. Well, naur deals with young adult. Um, we can do a word stu study on it. Let's see. Um, um, let's go down here a little bit. Um, right. Thy servants hath been about cattle from our youth. Right. Oh, they were they were born with with cows in their mom's belly. Um, but if a priest's daughter be a widow or divorced and have no child and is returned unto her father's house as in her youth. Oh, well, you know, OK. Yeah, she was a child in her infancy with her father. But this is talking about her life before marriage. Right. If a woman also has a vow unto the Lord and bind herself by a bond, being in her father's house since her youth. Again, babies aren't binding themselves by a bond. So what we end up seeing here, we, now I'm going to go up here to, uh, we'll look at Strong's, see what Strong has to say. I encourage you all not to stop with these concordances, but to actually go and do a word study yourself. Um, but you'll see here, it's dealing with childhood, youth, being a juvenile, right? So it's talking about our young adult years. I will never again curse the, the ground for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is set on wickedness from his youth. And if you actually, I want, I'll spare you the details. You can do this yourself. If you actually do a word study, it's saying that the imagination of man's heart becomes set on wickedness by his young adult years. It's more of that going astray, that that corruption, that hardening, um, that that rebellion that, that that creeps in. And this is in a generic sense. This isn't in a universal, this is a generic sense. This is God speaking in, in generality, that man's heart becomes set on wickedness by his youth. Um, and someone will say, well, wait a minute. Uh, Naor actually means infant, Warren. Yes, Naor means infant. And that word was available to the author of Genesis 8, should he want to say that man's heart is created wicked. The imagination of man's heart is created wicked. He could have said, you know, in his naor, in his infancy, but instead he used the word naar, meaning uh, young adult years. So Genesis 8 21 is another really strong proof text against original sin and total depravity, this Augustinian anthropology. But to the lay person the, the, who hasn't really studied this, they'll read that and they'll eisegete that anthropology into it not even aware that it's completely refuting what they're presupposing. Um, so that's a that's a fun one. Yo, 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 yo. Are we are we ripping on the gray? Look at that. Ooh, ooh, look at all that wisdom. You guys see that wisdom? Mm, I've got patches, I got patches of wisdom in my beard. I got patches of wisdom, just feathered. I'm overflowing with wisdom. You know, what did, what did they say? Uh, 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 was it there's a there's a verse in scripture. It says, uh, uh, yeah, the, a, a, a crown of gray, you know. Um, here we go. Ezekiel 18, two through four is a direct teaching against the tenet of total depravity. Now, we did mention Ezekiel, but let me jump over there so we can answer this. Genesis, or Ezekiel 18. And there's got to be an easier way of sharing my screen. Um, we're looking at verses two through four. But then the word of the Lord came to me saying, what do you people mean by using this proverb about the land of Israel, saying the fathers eat sour grapes, but it is the children's teeth that become blunt. Some Translations will say that the fathers eat sour grapes and their teeth, children are set on edge. But I love this. Uh, what do you people mean? What's wrong with you people? <laughs> what do you people mean by using this proverb? God is, God is, I mean, God is in his RC Sproul moment right here. What's wrong with you people? Like, why are you saying this? That hereditary guilt and sinful nature and no, like this is horrible. So here, there, here people are actually kind of teaching some sort of 
idea similar to original sin where the father does something, but it's the children that, that uh, become blunt, that suffer the guilt of that. And so here you see God say, as I live, you certainly are not going to use this proverb in Israel anymore. Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the father as well as the soul of the son is mine. But the soul of or the soul of whose sins will die. And then it goes on and it says, if a man is righteous and practices justice and righteous um, and righteousness, if he does not eat at the mountain shrines or raises. So it says, like, look, if he's not doing all these wicked things, then he'll live. But if he turns and does what is wicked. Wait a minute. Isn't he created wicked? What are we talking about a righteous man? There are none righteous, right? Romans 3. Do we need to jump over there? Let's let's jump over to Romans 3. Um, what am I looking at here? Oh, no. Here we go. Um, let's look at Romans 3. Oh, look right here, Warren. There is not a righteous person, not even one. There is no one who understands, no one who seeks God. See, that's total inability. That's the way they're created. That's Augustinian anthropology. Um, what does verse 12 say? They have all turned aside, meaning they've gone astray. Together they have become corrupt. There's no one who does good. There's no, not even one. Well, wait a second. They've become corrupt? What is the context of this? What? What possibly could, could this group be referring to? It's quoting Psalm 14 that is talking about the unbelieving fool who has said in his heart, there is no God. They, the unbeliever, is corrupt. They have committed detestable acts, right? So here we see sin is an action. It's a rebellion. Now, it does start in the heart, and we can meditate and we can talk about as a man thinks in his heart, so is he, and he starts to dwell on this, and then he gives himself over. But it's talking about sin and sinners and the wicked and the unbelievers. And these unbelievers who believe there is no God, who have committed detestable acts, there is none who does good. The Lord has looked down from heaven upon the sons of mankind to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. So this is talking about a specific moment in time where God looks down on the face of the earth. Now, my my friends who don't affirm dynamic omniscience are going to say that this is just a meaningless metaphor and an anthropomorphism that doesn't really have any weight. And, uh, and actual omniscience doesn't deal with sight. I have a video refuting Anthony Rogers where I go into biblical omniscience and how it's intrinsically linked to active knowledge and, and searching and testing and witnessing. But here it says that the Lord looked down from heaven upon the sons of mankind to see if there are any who understand, who seek God. They have all turned aside. Together they are corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. So is the author of Psalm 14 saying he doesn't believe in God? Is the author of, four, of Psalm 14 including in himself as a fool who says there is no God, who is doing detestable acts, who doesn't do good even though not one? No, we have to read the context. Do all the workers of injustice not know who devour my people as they eat bread? So here we're talking about unbelieving Gentiles, unbelieving wicked people, right? Who eat up my people as they eat bread and they do not call upon the Lord. They are in great dread for God is with who? A righteous generation. Well, how can you have a righteous generation? They're all created totally depraved. You would put to shame the plan of the poor, but the Lord is his refuge. Oh, the salvation of Israel would come to Zion. When the Lord restores the fortunes of his people, Jacob will resort, re rejoice and be glad. So what we're seeing in Psalm 14 is a, a, a condemnation against the wicked who do wicked things, who deny God. And it's this context that Romans 3 is drawing on. It is neither one of these passages are teaching Augustinian anthropology. Um, da, 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 da. Let's see. Um, here we go. Idol killer. Ecclesiastes 7.29 seems pretty soundly to imply that total depravity isn't a birth defect. Have you dealt with total depravity believers 
in this particular yes so let's let's jump over there i'll pull this up for y'all i appreciate everyone tuning in and sticking around i know if you can't you can always bounce back in um but i, I enjoy this sort of conversation with you guys so we're looking for uh verse 29 here we go um Behold, I have discovered, says the preacher, by adding one thing to another to find an explanation, which I am still seeking, but have not found. I have found one man among a thousand, but I have not found a woman among all these. Now, this is him talking about his experience. He's been actively looking. Then he goes on to say, Behold, I have found only this, that God made people upright, but they have sought out many schemes. So God creates us upright. But we seek out many uh, machinations. They have they've made many evil plans. This is talking about um, the individual choosing to depart into wickedness, to connive, to rebel, to reject their prior state of innocence and, and uprightness. Um, so that's a, a great passage. Thanks, Michael. Um, here we go. Uh, Deborah says, how is it possible that congregations don't know if they have a Calvinist pastor when they hire him? Uh, just found out the church we go to, the pastor is a, is a Calvinist. Sometimes you'll get people that are less than honest and forthright, and they keep it a secret. And um, there are certain sects within that group that will try to come in and overthrow non-Calvinist churches. Then they start replacing leadership, and they start trying to convert. Um when you see that at work, what you see is uh, some something that is coming in and sowing tares among the wheat. It's someone that's doing this intentionally. Rather than going out and witnessing, they're actually trying to convert Christianity, uh, Christians to Calvinism, this system of thinking. Um, and sometimes people are just Calvinists and they've never really thought about it. And they they there's tension in their beliefs and they think that that's biblical truth. And the pastoral committee that interviewed them didn't think to mention it because a lot of people are unaware of the diverse differences between, you know, Augustinian Calvinists and, and, uh, and the rest. And so I don't want to presuppose motive, but I will say those tend to be the, the two main categories where you'll see a, a, a Calvinist come into a non-Calvinist church. And if it's because the Pastoral committee did not stop and do the due diligence that they needed to. Shame on them. Um, they've brought significant pain and heartache into their congregation, and they're accountable. If it's because the pastor was deceptive and dishonest, then shame on him. He needs to repent and rebu be rebuked. Um, here we go. Uh, someone asked this. Uh, I've already addressed Romans 5. Uh, you might want to zip back. Uh, and watch this from the beginning. I don't think I'll even do timestamps because we've been all over the place on this one. But he says, uh, do you think Romans 5 mentions spiritual death or, or physical death? Um, spiritual death, I don't I don't see that anywhere in the text. It, it's talking about like what we would say, right? If you're, if you're on death row because you've committed a, a, a heinous act, we would say you're a dead man walking. It means you're dead. Like your fate has been determined. Like you've, you've sown and you have reaped, and it's just a matter of time, and you're going to be killed. You're going to die. So we're talking about mortality. Um, you know, someone on death row can repent, come to know the Lord, and still be a dead man walking, and uh, and be restored to to faith and relationship with God. So I don't see Romans five mentioning uh, spiritual death. Um, let's see. <laughs> Augustinianism intensifies. Um, still looking through here. Uh, Romans 7.18. Okay, now I believe, Pavel, I, I believe if I recall correctly, and I don't have all my notes in front of me here, but I believe that was Augustine who first equated Romans 7 to the life of an active believer rather than one before coming to faith. I'll have to go back and confirm that. I apologize. I don't I don't know everything off the top of my head. Um, he asks, do you think it's making a distinction between self and the flesh? 
and it is the flesh that is condemned by the law. I think what Romans 7 is dealing with is someone that has given themselves over to gratifying the Yetzir Hara, and they have created appetites and drives that now drive them. Just like God told Cain in Genesis 4 that sin is at the door and his desire is contrary to you, but you must master it. Romans 7 is talking to someone that opened the door wide open, invited sin in, and is now a slave to sin. Doesn't mean that they're totally unable. They can see that they're in bondage to sin. They can cry out to God for help. But I believe that Romans 7 is, is quite likely dealing with a, a pre-faith convert, or at least the, the bulk of that, that passage. Um, oh, here we go. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ says, what specifically is the seed of corruption in 1 Peter 1.23? Now, man, you're going to throw out one I don't think I've considered yet. Look at this. 1 Peter 1. What do we say? 23? Let's look at it together. Hopefully I have an answer for you. If I don't, I will get back to you. I might do an episode on this. Uh, Since you have purified your souls in obedience to the truth for a sincere love of the brothers and sisters, fervently love one another from the heart. For you have been born again not of a seed which is perishable, but an imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring word of God. Oh, I I think that's saying that the the seed is the truth that is conveyed in the word of God, and that that truth isn't um, going to wither. It's going to be true whether you you receive it or not. Um, Yeah, but the, the word of the Lord endures forever. So it's talking about the actual word is imperishable. Like the 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 word of the Lord will not return void. Um, I think I think those are the sort of illusions that it's talking to. If you disagree, let me know. I can always uh, do more study on the topic. That's my first blush. You know, taking a look at it. Um, hey, somebody said it. Gamaliel. There you go. Thank you. I was asking earlier. I, I have a hard time with that one. Uh, Demitar says, do you think someone's view of original sin and total depravity is important in sharing the gospel? Yes. Oh, my goodness. Yes. I uh, went to a Baptist church with my family last year. I want to say se- August, I think it was August or September. And um, we sit down in the pew as a family and we were visiting. They were doing a vacation Bible school. And I try to give my kids a wide variety of Christian perspectives and experiences. So, um, you know, we're putting them in uh, VBS from, you know, different, different perspectives and it's better than, than nothing. And then I instruct them at home a lot. <clears throat> Let me get a drink here. Mm. But um, what we ended up doing was um, uh, sitting down in the church and the pastor gets up and he starts saying, Hey, we're going to share the gospel with you guys. We know you're here for VBS to watch your kids do a play And we want to share the gospel. And uh, he starts to do an introduction. The kids aren't up on the stage yet or anything. But he says, um, you know, the gospel is that you were created spiritually dead because of Adam's sin. And then he goes on to give penal substitutionary atonement. That God couldn't forgive you of the state he created you in. So he poured his wrath on Christ. And now, now, now you're in. And my kids are looking at me and they're like, Dad, do you get a load of this stuff? Can you believe this guy? He's saying the gospel is that God created us spiritually dead and couldn't forgive us for the state he created us in and then had to pour his wrath on Jesus. Like, can you get a load of this guy? And I I try not to weep because I was like, that pastor has no clue what the gospel is. Um, He has no clue. Now, he may on some sort of um, subconscious or tangential line have heard the gospel, recognized it, received it, believed it. But he's so deluded by false presuppositions, he can't articulate it. And that is the true mark of heresy. Something that so greatly obfuscates the person and work of Christ that salvation becomes impossible or or more difficult uh, because of those false teachings. So I think I think it's I think it definitely um, impacts. So the fact of the matter is, I think when most people, though, share the gospel, they go, look, you know, way of the master kind of thing. Like, have you ever lied? Oh, then you're a liar. You ever lusted? Oh, then you've committed adultery in your heart. Have you ever done this, this? You ever steal candy when you were a kid, you know, from your 
sister's Easter basket. Oh, then you're a thief, you know, and God hates you. And, you know, and, but, but the good news is God also loves you and you need to repent. So I think most of the time when, when Augustinians are sharing the gospel, they focus on personal sin and then they focus on God's love. And then once you accept that, then they get you in and start trying to tell you all this trash and garbage uh, that has nothing to do with that. Uh, Gamaliel, Gamaliel, Gamaliel. Don't look, say that five times fast, all right? Uh, Travis, no, only the NIV translation of Psalm 51.5 does. Yeah, so so here's some translations of Psalm 51.5 that are not translations. They'll come in and they'll say, surely I was a sinner at birth. That's not a translation. Go to the Hebrew. I mean, I went to my Calvinist Sunday school teacher who is an expert in, in biblical Hebrew. I went to my pastor when I was still a Calvinist and I was seeing this. And I was like, please show me where it says total depravity in the text. This is what I'm seeing. And they said, no, you're right. It's not there. It doesn't say that. That's a that's not a translation. That's an interpretation with a heavy bias. But they still said, we still believe in total depravity, even though it's not expressly stated in the text. And we use this in our models to teach it. And um, that bothered me. So I stopped being a Calvinist. But, um, you know, I love those people. I, I, you know, still stay in touch with them and, and, and have you know, great respect for them and a lot of things that they do. I just disagree with them on their on their Calvinism. So I'm not you know, throwing stones. But um, but no, I mean, even people who disagree with my conclusions are agreeing with my arguments, if that makes sense. Um, did you see the Soteriology 101 cast about classical theism re recently? And do you have any profound thoughts? Well, yes. Uh, not a fan of classical theism. Classical theism is um, predicated mostly upon Neoplatonist pagan philosophy. It requires one to dismiss the entirety of God's self-revelation in scripture as a meaningless metaphor, um, analogy, and anthropomorphism, lacking any real meaning, that God condescends to us so much that even the act of condescension is a condescension, and we can know nothing about him apart from apathetic um, subtractions, saying God is not evil. We don't know what good means, but we know God is not evil. So, no, I, I've come to, to thoroughly reject classical theism. My views and, you know... Um, you know, someone wants to call me more of a literalist. I still believe that the Bible uses metaphor. I believe the Bible uses anthropomorphism. And I believe the context makes it clear when that's happening and when God is being forthright and revealing his heart and nature and the way he operates. But classical theism, I believe, would require all of that to be dismissed. Because if you hold to, you know, a hard impassibility, hard immutability, all temporality, it just... You end up with the the God of, of Plato, which is like a perfect do nothing thing that is the foundational atom for all creation that is so further removed from creation that, you know, God didn't even create. You end up getting into that. So, you know, when you say God is all temporal by nature and I go, well, when did he create? There was never a moment in the life where he created. OK, so then creation is eternal. No. So you end up engaging in some. I don't want to go too far off topic today. Not a fan of classical theism. Yeah, by nature in Ephesians 2, 3 has multiple meanings in the Greek. And one is which uh, is the form by long habit. Uh, Ephesians 22 isn't in my Bible. <laughs> yeah, no, here you go. Um, oh, here we go. David and Laura. Let's look at this, shall we? Let's go to Psalm 34. I'm going to hit a few Psalms while we're here. So Psalm 34, um, I sought the Lord and he answered me and rescued me from all my fears. Right now, the adherent of Augustinian anthropology will say, well, this is just he's already been regenerated. What you don't understand is the only way he could seek the Lord is because of, you know, effectual prevenient grace. But let's look at what happens when we get to Psalm. For you are my hope, Lord God. You are my confidence from my youth. I have leaned on you since my birth. 
You are he who took me from my mother's womb. My praise is of you continually. Right? So, um, yeah. Uh, the Psalms are not, they're not ammunition for the Augustinian. Um, let's see. We're going to keep going here. Um, looking for... Yeah, so Andrew says, here lately, I'm really seeing the impact of Augustine. Oh, my goodness. From the predominant view of anthropology to the now, you know, overwhelming uh, atonement theory within Protestantism that's predicated upon an Augustinian anthropology and saying, hey, these earlier redemptive models just don't work. We have to create a new one. Um, you know, this whole idea of uh, sex in, in marriage. And you start to say, well, why does, why do these churches have such a big problem with, you know, sexual abuse? And I hope that doesn't get me demonetized. Oh my gosh. See, but you say, well, why are they having problems with these sorts of things? And, uh, and you see that it's the view that they have. And if you, if you, if you want to encourage bad behavior, prohibit it, um, hit it hard with legalism and it stirs up the rebelliousness in, in us, and, and and it starts to get us to think about things we, we might not have otherwise. You know, had had Augustine converted and been told, "Hey, man, God loves the married, the widow, and the virgin. Like, you know, get married, and enjoy making babies. Like, be fruitful and multiply. I love your wife, and you know, read read the Song of Solomon. You know, Augustine. Like, get at it. You know, I don't think we would have had half the problems that we have today. Uh, as far as doctrine, you know." Um, Nathan says, once you study Augustine for a bit and see what he actually believed in comparison to the earlier church fathers, you see the errors everywhere. Oh yeah. Big time. Um, yeah. And I've got a, I've got a video on infant damnation where I go into this idea of the age of accountability. And what you find is that the only people that could actually meet the requirement, um, are the ones that are said to be spared from it. The age of accountability is, is, is rather problematic as it's commonly understood. But there is, there is this idea where God is judging people based on the measure of light that they had, the measure of understanding and all of that. But um, in that Augustinian anthropology, the, the way that they handle the age of accountability is often very convoluted and contradictory. So check that video out. You can go into more detail there. Um, Keep looking here. Um, trying to find some stuff, you guys. I'm going to make sure I'm hitting the, the comments uh, where you're actually asking some questions. Here we go. Here we go. Mind trap. James 2.16, doesn't this principle of not making demands without offering help? Useless uh, idea, God demanding of dead people to repent. Let's look at James 2.16. What use is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled, yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? In the same way, faith also, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. So I think the question Mind Trap is asking is like, hey, look, isn't aren't we seeing here a principle that God operates by where if he's going to call us to do something, he'll provide a way for us to do it. Um, and um, he wouldn't call us to do something that would be impossible or contrary to us. And I, I think I think that you're seeing that there. I think that's reasonable. Um, yeah. So, the, you know, you get into the Marian dogmas um, and when you get into co-redemptrix and you have, you know, people praying to Mary to intercede on their behalf, um, you know, I I don't see how you get around that from just being a, a total rejection of, of Christ as redeemer and intercessor. Um, but that comes that comes from Hellenistic uh, and pagan influences merging with uh, Augustine's anthropology and as they try to invent doctrines to like keep Christ pure from original sin, they end up squashing Christ and elevating Mary 
Um, not every Catholic is, you know, worshiping Mary, but their doctrine sure is problematic in, in many areas. Um, let's see. Yeah. Um, if Mary required an immaculate conception, it would follow Mary's mother would have needed an immaculate conception too, and her mother before her, and her mother all the way back to Eve. And so what you end up with is seminal identity. Uh, you'll hear people say that sin is in the spermazoa. Uh, I'm trying to think of a clever way of saying that without hopefully flagging. But um, they'll say that sin is in the man's seed. And you get into this Gnostic idea of sinful flesh, like literally sinful flesh. Like you could put it under a microscope and go, oh, look at that little, that little sin with the flagella spinning around, you know. So uh, Michael says, we don't hold St. Augustine, his view on original sin. What you, that's, that's, that's fair. Not all Catholics do. And in fact, you actually have a letter that the former Pope put out in conjunction with the, I believe, the new Pope called the Hope for Salvation for uh, Infants. or something like that. I, I address it in, in my series in which they're, they're essentially walking back infant limbo, infant damnation, and saying, look, we've never officially endorsed these, although they've been kind of like unofficial views. Uh, we believe that these conclusions of Augustinian anthropology are not in fitting, they're not in keeping with the revealed redeemer and lover in Christ. And so you actually see Rome's official position, while they don't reject Augustinian original sin in the letter, they are rejecting some of the inferences and the consequences that uh, many Catholics had held to during that time. So they actually are taking an official stand on against some of those positions, which I think is very uh, good news and uh, does my heart good. Um, so, yeah, I think that that's a, a fair position. Um, let's look here. Looking for more. All right. Um, come on, Warren. Why not use the NIV translation of Psalm 51.5? Yeah, no, thank you. Uh, to call it a translation, let's just look at this piece of trash. Let's, <laughs> all right, let's look at Psalm. We're going to go. This, would you? Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. No, that's not that's not what the text is saying. Um, someone said that I think I think I'd heard James White was on the had some involvement with the NIV. Am I mistaken on that? Um, surely I was sinful at birth. No, go go get out your interlinear, do word searches, get out a um, uh, you know your 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 Hebrew dictionary. No, not there, guys. I'm sorry. Um, let's keep looking. What do we got here? Um, Dreaxo says, Psalm 51, verse 5, On one hand, in waywardness I was birthed, in wrongdoing my mother conceived me. Hmm. Um. Oh, now, now here people will say, okay, well, Warren, are you saying, are you saying that Psalm 51 5 teaches that Jesse, um, his wife, David's mom, committed adultery? No. There is a, uh, there's actually a, a, a Hebrew tradition that's not in uh, the Torah, um, but it's part, it's part of, uh, like, if you're going to go get a midrash or something and, and and read the uh, the Jewish tradition. They say that um, I believe her name was Netzva, but they say that um, she was of pure Jewish stock. But Jesse believed his lineage would be corrupt. There was a question because he was the descendant of uh, um, Ruth and Boaz, and there was a question as to whether or not that um, lineage was was sound. 
And so Jesse decided that he was going to put his wife away and uh, marry or consummate with uh, her servant. And so they schemed together, these two women schemed together to dress Jesse's wife up, who she'd already had several children with him, um, like the uh, the servant and go into him uh, when it was dark and under the, 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 the mask of, of night, you know? And so you had a man who put his wife away and she sneaks in pretending to be a woman he's having an affair with. And so a husband and wife copulated through deceptive means. And she became pregnant with, with David. And this is, and I can go into more detail on this in the original sin series, but this is one of the reasons why uh, he was, David was put out by Jesse and battling lions and, and, uh, and, uh, and bears. Um, and it's why when the prophet came to him and said, Hey, where are your children? He's like, Oh, here they are. You don't have any other. Oh, there's that one other kid over there. You know, he's the youngest, but like Jesse thought he wasn't his legitimate child. Um, you know, there was, there was a lot there. David says in Psalms that the drunks would get at the, the gate and sing and make fun of him, that his brothers didn't consider him a relative. So there is clear indication in the canon of scripture that that um, Jewish tradition is is valid. And that's kind of where I go with it. I don't think it was um, adultery, but I do think that it was problematic and it was based in less than honesty and less than truth. And there it was, uh, their relationships was sinful, although sinful in marriage. Um, okay, here we go. Uh, I listened to Sonny and Matt Slick debate. It was interesting, like an unstoppable force meeting an immovable object. Okay. Um, still going through here. Um, here we go. Uh, Josh says, uh, being with your wife's handmaid with your wife's permission was not technically adultery and I doubt it was ever an act of faith. Yeah. Yeah. No, Jesse, Jesse, Jesse was not really trusting in the Lord and thinking he was going to fix things himself. Um, here we go. Ray says, good afternoon. God bless you all. Hello, Ray. Looking through here for some more questions. Here we go. What's wrong with acknowledging that we are totally depraved and need a savior to get us to the father? Well, total depravity negates that we have a savior. It's a fundamental denial that Christ assumed the totality of our nature to redeem it because it would corrupt the incarnation. So if we say that you and I are spiritually dead, guilty, under God's wrath, that's the state we're created in, that our flesh, our will, our soul, our mind is stained by sin, deserving death, condemnation, wrath, and that Christ came like us in every respect, we've just corrupted the incarnation. So we don't have a spotless redeemer who redeemed the totality of our nature. So then we are left either denying the redemptive work and the incarnation of Christ as described in scripture, or we say that he was spared some aspect of our nature. And therein, again, we end up denying the uh, redemptive work. Um, but then also here's the other problem in episode two of my ongoing series, I deal with, uh, what I call the undercutting defeater. And that is that as total depravity asserts, your intellect is corrupt, that you're naturally incapable of rightly understanding spiritual truth. This is uh, affirmed and attested from various, um, uh, confessions. It's affirmed by various reformed theologians. Like it's very well documented according to total depravity. You are spiritually dead and cannot rightly understand and respond to, to spiritual truth. You have to have pre-faith regeneration. So what that does is that negates any, any sense that you have for validating a justified true belief. It makes truth unknowable. So you, you'll never know if you've been regenerated because regeneration is a spiritual truth in and of itself. You'll never know if you've had an experience because you have to filter that through you're totally depraved and incapable faculties. There's, it, it just, it is an assault on reason and it's a form of gaslighting. So total depravity will come in and say, you can't understand spiritual truth, but if you can understand this as a spiritual truth, then you're saved. So follow me and I'll do your thinking for you. That's pretty much the way that, that total depravity uh, operates. 
and there's more, like I said, go check out episode two in that ongoing series that I have. It's a playlist that says, uh, are we born sinful? I believe is what it's called. Um, looking here, looking here. Um, any more questions? I want to make sure we get through these. Today's a long live stream, and I'm sure people are going to break this up into various um, segments, but I want to get as much done as I can. I enjoy visiting with you guys. Um, let's see. Here we go. Question. With its emphasis on federal headship, doesn't covenant theology buttress the doctor, doctrine of um, original sin? I mean, federal headship certainly is a construct designed to defend and promote this idea of um, Augustinian anthropology, original sin, you know, that we're created in Adam and that we're spiritually moved from Adam to Christ. Um, and they, they, they get there from various ways, but yeah, it is, it is there to support uh, and defend that view. Um, looking here. Um, here we go. What had the extent of the mistranslation that Augustine had of Romans, the whole book, or just so in in Romans five? Um, Basically, what he is doing is he is reading Romans 5 and assuming that we were in the loins of Adam. Not that sin and death spread, but guilt. And I, I probably could do a, I need to do an episode just on Romans 5 and address that with actual quotes. I don't want to uh, misspeak here, but uh, essentially there was a, a mistranslation where he believed that we were receiving the guilt of Adam rather than the consequences of death in the world and, and being enabled to sin. So he thought we actually possessed Adamic, uh, Adamic guilt. Um, question, could you give your short take about Christian universalism? I'm not a universalist in the sense of universal salvation. Um, I don't think that I can support that from Scripture. Uh, I think that it's a, a nice thought, and I think it would make apologetics perhaps a little bit easier. Um, but I just don't see that being the case. And I think ultimately uh, the reason why you have wicked who are raised to destruction is because of God's love and because of their choices. So I have to disagree with them on that. I think that it's contrary to the very nature of God as love. I think it requires that. Um I do believe in universal um, provision for all mankind. So I believe that it's available to all, but I do not believe that all will uh, receive or accept it. And I believe that there will be many who, when it says every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, that I believe that they'll be doing that through gritting their teeth and uh, in, in bitter resentment and anger, um, just as, as that's the nature of, of rebellion against God. Uh, but I don't. I don't hold to to universalism. I do hold to universal provision, which is different. Question: When they ate, they gained the knowledge of good and evil. How does this relate to other good and evil passages, such as Deuteronomy one thirty nine, Isaiah seven? Oh my goodness, BJ, you're going to derail this train at the near the end of this live stream. Um, well, let's let's just look at uh, Deuteronomy one thirty nine. Okay. Let's just look and see. D. I always, I always spell Deuteronomy wrong. Do you guys do that? I always spell it D U E. Um, 139. Let's see. Um, and the little ones. Okay, so because of you, the Lord became angry with me also and said, You shall not enter it either, but your assistant, Joshua, son of Nun, will enter it. Encourage him because he will lead Israel to inherit it. 
and the little ones that you said would be taken captive, your children who do not yet know good from bad, they will enter the land and I will give it to them and they will take possession of it. But as for you, turn around and set toward the desert along. Yeah, so what you see like in Isaiah uh, 7, 7, 15 and 7, 14. Yeah, okay, I, I get the reference now. It's been a long day. Um, but here in Deuteronomy, we're seeing that it says that the, the little ones don't know good or bad yet. They don't know the, the, the distinction from that. They don't have the cognitive faculties to make those decisions. So, you know, if, if you want to say that, well, this is pointing to um, an age of accountability where they don't know the difference from good and evil and God doesn't hold them accountable because their motives are not, um, you know, wicked or evil. Um, but yet they're still doing things that are what we would consider morally wrong and therefore becoming hard. And yeah, there's an argument there. But look at what happens when you get to 714. Right? Um, let's get over to Isaiah 7. Now, this is a, uh, a scripture that is is, is uh, messianic. Um, the, then Isaiah said, uh, here now, you house of David, is it not enough to try the patience of humans? Will you try the patience of my God also? Well, that's just metaphorical, right? God doesn't have patience. That would that would require temporal and emotion, and we have to dismiss all this. No, no, God is God is dynamic. The Old Testament God. Christine Hayes. I was watching a video from Christine Hayes the other day. She's a Hebraic scholar, and she described the God of the Old Testament as dynamic, living, active, responsive. And I'm like, Amen and Amen. Uh, but here it says, uh, Therefore, the Lord Himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and he will call him Emmanuel. Okay, so let's this there's I'm gonna continue here in a minute. But the virgin conception is a sign that he is Messiah. It's not a means to spare him the nature he's coming to redeem. It's just a sign that he's our Messiah. Okay, and he'll call him Emmanuel, which means what? Lord with us, right? And it says, he will be eating curds and honey when he knows enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. For before the boy knows enough to reject wrong and choose the right, the land of the two kings you dread you know, will be laid to waste. So we see this being mentioned like in passing, just kind of flippant. Like, yeah, like kids don't know the difference between right and wrong. They're not accountable. Um you know, so the, these sort, of, and this is this is related to the Messiah. Now, some people will say this isn't re referencing the virgin birth; that this is talking about the young woman will conceive. You know, other people will counter that this is a, a prophecy that had dual meaning. Um, you know, to Isaiah's time as well as the the Messiah. I'm kind of of that opinion as well. But in both cases, you have children who don't know enough to reject the wrong and choose the right. They're innocent. We would call that a, like a tabala. Uh, tabula rasa, like a blank slate. They just don't know. They don't have that information, which is why scripture says, raise a child in the way they should go. And when they are older, they will not depart from it. How, how can you raise a totally depraved child in the way they should go? Right? They're, they're incapable. And the reformed will say often, oh no, like, uh, you know, children of the reformed who who perish? They they're part of the elect. They're going to go to heaven, um, you know, and and, uh, and and so we we can see that. Well, you see some some uneven handling uh, of these things. Just raise your kid in the way that that they should go. When they're older, they won't depart. Why? Because total depravity isn't true. It's the very same reason I brought up with Matt Slick in our debate, which I've got in my debate section here. And I was like, I held up a children's Bible, a children's Bible. I said. They can't understand spiritual truth because they're totally depraved. Why do we print these out for them? Why are we trying to raise them in the way they should go? And he was just silent for a good 30 seconds. And then it was like, you're using a children's Bible? And I was like, yes, to make a very clear point that you obviously don't have an answer to. Um, here we go. Uh, question, how do you understand Romans 8.3? Let's look at that. Oh, you know, man, you know what? I am still in the NIV, you guys. Ooh, scary stuff. Let me get out of the NAS. There we go. Um, Romans 8. Uh, okay. 
Therefore, there is now no condemnation for all those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh as an offering for sin. He condemned sin in the flesh, so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So here we're talking about, like, let's look look at the heading here, deliverance from bondage. Some will say, well, this, this is just meaning that, um, you know, that you're totally depraved and God came and zapped you with pre-faith, effectual regeneration, gave you a brand new heart, gave you faith. That's what this is talking about. None of that's actually stated here. Uh, bondage of, of, of creating a nature by practicing sin, um, God sets us free from that. We can cry out to him and, and he, he will He will intervene. Um, Ezekiel 18 would say like, okay, yeah, a, a wicked man who does wicked things is in bondage to sin, but not such that he can't cry out to God and repent, right? Um, because the, the, the Bible is very clear that he can turn and live. But what this is talking about is not that flesh is inherently sinful, but in this connotation, it's talking about death. In the likeness of sinful flesh, meaning mortal flesh, meaning um, something that is driven by its appetites. In the likeness, the similitude, the same. Um, so this isn't saying, this isn't, this isn't a teaching a docetist sort of view of the incarnation where it was like an ethereal hologram or that Jesus only appeared to have our flesh, but it's saying he had our flesh, the similitude, the sameness, the same substance. This isn't at odds with like Hebrews 2, 14 through 18 or first John four. Um, but we're seeing here that he, he accomplished by assuming our nature, living perfectly so that he redeemed us, um, that we had given ourselves over to the appetites. We had given ourselves over. We'd all gone astray. We'd We'd veered. We'd, we'd developed these, these uh, uh, proclivities. We had corrupted ourselves. And while we all bent the knee to sin, Christ did not. He, he stood firm and therein redeemed us. So that's kind of how I take it. Um, let's look here. It says here, he says... Uh, Warren sounded angry. What do you people mean? What's wrong with you people? No, I'm I'm not angry. Um, okay, let's see. I'm looking through the uh, the questions here. I want to make sure I'm answering these. Looking through. Hey, thank you for that, Shami. That's I appreciate that. <laughs> BJ, almost two hours. This is COVID late in length. Yeah, you know what? We're going to be here all day, you guys. I'm, I'm going through the entire Bible today. Uh, no, maybe not. Maybe not. Um, looking through here. Um, uh, trying to find some questions. Here we go. Can you please share your gospel? Um, you know, I have, let's see here. I have a video. Um, see if I can find this thing. I'm looking, people. I'm looking. Where did I put this? Um, I want to show you something. Here we go. I'm going to show you something real quick. And um, hopefully hopefully you guys can hear this. I'll try and turn it up. Let me tell you something about man and God. Scripture says we are fearfully and wonderfully created by God in our mother's womb, that we're a marvelous work of God 
entirely dependent upon him and that we are his image bearers. We're told sin is contrary to who we are and that it seeks to rule over us, but that we must master it and that we depart our initial state of innocence and go astray into sin and trespasses, developing a nature in bondage to sin and rightly deserving judgment. That by our young adult years, the imagination of our hearts has become set on wickedness. And yet even in such a state as this, we can come to our senses and return to the Father who draws all men to himself, promising to freely and abundantly pardon us and lavishing his restorative love upon us and declaring us innocent once more. We're told that in order to redeem man and conquer the hold of the grave, that Jesus came in our flesh and our blood and was like us in every respect. And that in the greatest example of selfless love in the history of the universe, he took on our suffering and our death upon himself. And though he was tempted in every way as we are, and though he suffered greatly, he did not stumble. He did not waver. He did not sin. We don't have a cold and uncaring God who can't sympathize with our suffering. We have a God who picked up his own cross and showed us just how much he understands and how far he is willing to go to save us. You see, man was created in the image of God and would walk with him in paradise in the cool of the day. And it's in the arms of your heavenly father where you will find true freedom, love, fulfillment, joy, realizing the purpose for which you were created. God is the source of life and all good things. Apart from him, there is only the absence of such things, pain and death. You may be like Adam and Eve and hiding in the bushes, afraid of what he will think when he sees the mess that you've made. But when the father sees you returning, he will rush out to greet you, throw his arms around you, kiss your dirty face and cover you in his best robe, place a ring on your finger, celebrate and declare, my child who was dead is alive again. Return to him while there is time. So um, <clears throat> I wanted to play that to kind of give you kind of like a overview of, of my position here. Um, I believe that sin entered the world through Adam. Oh, and uh, that suffering, suffering and, and, and death and, and all that followed. And uh, this was contrary to God's desire and his plan for us. And in response to sin, he gave us his only begotten son because of his great love. In response to our sin, he determined to lay down his life to redeem us, to call us friend and to show us love while we were yet his enemies. And he did this victoriously and he conquered the hold of the grave and he demonstrated his great love on the cross with his arms outstretched saying, I love you this much. Um, desiring that none should perish, but everyone should come to him and live. That your sin is death. And it may feel fun for a season, but when you hold on to it, you're really just, you're inviting pain and death into your life and that he loves you and he wants you to repent. He has something better for you. Um, and so I, I, I try to focus on the person's individual sin. I try to focus on the incarnation and the victory and the message of love. Um, but I also note that if we persist in this and we hold on to our rebellion and we reject him, if we willfully, knowingly reject him, then the only thing that, that remains for us is his absence. And since he's life, the only thing we would have is his absence, which is death. And so, you know, we don't need to fear the first death. Christ has shown us he's conquered that. But for all who reject him, the second death, where God can destroy both body and soul in hell, that awaits. And um, God doesn't want that for us. And it's up to us whether or not we're going to receive him and respond to him. He's not going to force himself on us. He'll force his judgment. But love love, and force are, are, are contrary to one another. Um, 
someone someone asked me. They said, uh, "What uh, what Bible version do you recommend?" I, I read the NASB, the the KJV, and the ESV interchangeably and often at the same time. And then when I see some sort of significant difference or an area of question that I have, then I'll jump over to the actual Hebrew or Greek and start doing word searches and see how it was used the, like early, early, early on. Like I want to try and find the very first instances of it being used in scripture, because that's going to give you the clearest understanding of how that term is to be understood. Subsequent uses can give like further explanation on it. And then I'll go to, to various theological dictionaries and, and look at that. Um, Let's see. Here we go. What do we got? Um, does Isaiah 7, 15 through 16 also show the age of accountability and no sin nature? Again, it kind of depends on how you're defining uh, age of accountability. And I, I, I mean, there is, a, there is a time in everyone's life where they become keenly aware of the differences between right and wrong. Um, but what happens when you combine that with an inherited sinfulness and guilt some interesting things happen. And, and I've got a, like I said, I've got a video on that under the topic, I think, Infant Damnation, which I recommend you watch. It goes into a lot more detail there than I could here. Um, let's see. Um, trying to find some more questions, guys. I want to make sure I'm answering these. Are y'all having a good day? It, it's been cold and wet and rainy here in Georgia. Um, I made some I made some beef stew for me and the kiddos the other night, and uh, they devoured it. First time I ever made stew, and I love stew. I'm a consumer, but this is the first time I ever made it. And um, now I'm kind of in a chili and cornbread kind of mood. You can tell it's almost lunchtime. Well, it's it's past lunch here. Uh, let's see. Keep them looking here for, um, all right. Jfef, my friend, since you talk about classical theism, do you believe God experiences a first moment? As an open theist, this is a constant position I take when rejecting classical theism. Uh, you know, you could describe it as a, um, an eternal moment absent measure. Um, you know, but I would I would also say that likely any sort of internal thought in God um, would be a mechanism by which it could be measured. But then how long is a thought? You get into some really interesting philosophical positions when you start going down that line. But um, I, I try to take scripture at face value as much as possible. Um, and I believe that it describes him as eternal, meaning inhabiting age from age to age to age to age. Not that he is absent sequence or duration. He experiences and operates through those things, but he just has no beginning. So as far as, as God's existence, I, I don't really think there was a first thought. But I would default to a, 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 a world in the philosophical sense where God exists absent anything other than himself. And then that world would be absent any sort of external measure of time. And so then the question really becomes is how does one measure internal sequence, you know, discursive thought and that sort of thing? Like how long did a thought last? And then you get into some really interesting things where that could still be happening for what we would consider to be a bazillion years, but it would still be arguably um, in a single timeless instant. So, um, and I say timeless, I mean mechanistic, like measurement wise. Um, but that's that's a topic for another show, and I'll try and bring in smarter men than me to to explore that one. Uh, universalism, according to Nathan, would mean sin has no spiritual consequence, or at least no eternally lasting spiritual consequence. And I think I think that uh, we can see in Scripture that it does. You know, I mean, we can. We can see where death and the wicked are thrown into the lake of fire and destroyed, and God wipes away the tears from his people. Um, so I think that there is a finite view of sin in Scripture already. 
but that has significant consequences to the individual, eternal consequences to the individual. Um, let's see. What do we got here? I think this is a question. What do you think of the idea that since the fall, we are no longer in God's image, but are now in Adam's image? No, I, I think that sin and death and suffering marred the image of God, but we retain that. And I think that Christ picked that up and healed it and restored it. Um, you know, I, I hold to a couple redemptive models. Uh, recapitulation. Not that Christ had to drink every Frappuccino and wear every sneaker that we wore, um, but that he assumed the totality of human nature to redeem it. He suffered to redeem it, to heal. He died and rose again to redeem and, and deliver us. I also affirm ransom where, you know, when, when Satan took Satan up and I mean, when Satan took Jesus up in front of the, the, the great um, high place and said, look at all these kingdoms of the world. I'll give these to you if you bow down to me. Satan was declaring he had dominion. He had authority over those. Um, and I think that uh, what Jesus did was in laying down his life, kind of like Aslan in the Chronicles of Narnia, uh, he ransomed us from those claims. So in a certain sense, we can say that God saved us from the hold of Satan, the claim of Satan, but also he saved us from death itself. And so I don't see ransom as a payment, but I see it as in the same sense of a rescue, like um, when God ransomed the Hebrews from, from Egypt. He rescued them. He delivered them out of that captivity, that bondage. So I would hold the, that kind of view of ransom. I also hold the moral influence that Jesus taught us what it is to, to love and understand God. And he taught us uh, like the, the true heart of God. Um, and I hold to uh, Christus Victor, which is kind of a amalgam of those, as well as the restored icon, meaning that the icon was damaged. It was marred by sin. I don't think that um, it was utterly destroyed, but I do believe that it was deeply wounded. And Christ took that up and suffered those wounds and then restored us. So I hope that answers your question. Um, boy, we've got a lot of comments going on in the chat today, folks. Appreciate you guys sticking with me through today. This has been a long one. I've enjoyed it. Let's see. All right, Stefan. What do you think about Bible passages like lake of fire and sulfur being mistranslated, rather an image of a tiny pond and molten metal? No, I, I don't. I don't hold to. Um, I don't hold to it. Um, I, I, I think of lake of fire is, and this is this is where maybe I'm being inconsistent. Maybe, but I hold to it as a as a metaphor for uh, for God's wrath, which is utter destruction. Uh, I don't think that the lake of fire is an, is an actual place. Um, and I don't see it as refining. I see it as destruction. Um, let's see. I'm still looking through here. Um, all right. Scrolling through, man. There's a lot of comments on the side. I appreciate you guys tuning in. And no, have we been going this long? What's Layton's record? What's Layton's record? Uh, do we need to go eight hours? What do, what do I need to do to beat Layton Flowers' record for length of live stream? Let's double it. Let's go eight hours. <laughs> um, yeah. No, this is this is fun. Um, so Joseph says, uh, or Joshua says, uh, monarchical Trinitarians agree that the father is the only God. That's true. Uh, basically as a monarchical Trinitarian, uh, like who affirms, you know, like the Eastern view full of controversy aside, uh, you would say that the father is the font of the divine nature, the source of the divine nature, uh, and that Christ and the Holy spirit are almost and anytime you get into analogies, you're going to get accused of heresy, but it's almost like arms proceeding from the father. It's they, they've had an eternal relationship. I don't see the, the son as created. I see him as begotten. 
And before he was begotten as the Messiah, he was the word. Um, and so I see, I see it in a, in a construct of, of essence. I don't think I have a diagram. Actually, let me see if I have a diagram on my desktop. I'm kind of one of those guys. I do. I'm one of those guys that has his desktop looking horribly cluttered. And in this case, it might actually, um, Oh yeah, look at this. Okay. So this is this is, and I know this isn't related, but I wanted to answer it because hey, why not? Um, this is kind of the Nicene model, the Eastern model of the Trinity. Uh, a lot of you guys will probably see one where it says like the Father is not the Son, is not the Spirit, and they kind of like assemble like an Autobot to form God. But here we see Father is. Um, Actually, let me see if I can make this a little bit bigger. There we go. Uh, father is autotheos, um, and the son is eternally deriving his um, divine nature from the father. The spirit is eternally proceeding from the father. This doesn't have the, the Philoke controversy in it. This is kind of how the Nicene Trinitarians affirmed it. And it's why a, a few of the attendees that were modalists could even affirm this. So I, I like it. I don't make it a salvational issue. Um, maybe we need to do a whole episode on that. That'd be kind of fun. Um, yo, what is going on today? Making the money. Hey, thank you, Grace, Mercy, Wrath. I appreciate that. That's awesome. Thank you so much for that. I, I think I'm going to average about 50 cents an hour by the time this program's over. So I'm making the money. I appreciate that. I really do. Um, oh, cool. We can continue. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, guys. Um, let's see. We're looking here. Okay, here we go. Would you compare the open theist position with what we currently understand through artificial intelligence, e.g. knowing all the past and all the future? I don't, I don't, I don't like to draw parallels between AI. I, I don't, um, I don't, I don't buy into the whole like simulation theory and all that. Um, so I try to, I try to keep it as grounded in scripture as I can. Ah, omniscience. Ooh, 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 ooh. All right. I'm going to, I'm going to freeform this. Um, I have written definitions down that are going to be more accurate. So with a huge disclaimer that I reserve the right to amend this later to make sure that I'm completely accurate, I'll give you kind of a, an overview. But it's it's the idea, um, oh, you said omnificence. I thought you were asking me about omniscience. Omnificent, what the heck is omnificent? Um, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to Google this. What are we, what are we looking at here? Omnificence. Creating all things, having unlimited powers of creation, derived forms, omnificence. Look at that. Thank you, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm learning new terms today. Um, I thought I had a veritable cornucopia of uh, words to draw from. I thought I was verbose. and uh, But yeah, okay, so... Um, omnificent is uh, creating all things, having unlimited powers of creation. Um, I'm not sure if that's what you were getting at or if you were asking me about omniscience. Omnificent just seems to say that he creates all things. Now, some people might take that and say he creates evil. He creates all sorts of, like, you get into, like, determinism if you're going to hold to omnificent. If you're going that way, I'm going to have to say no. If you're just saying that God is... Um, the chief creator, then I could affirm that. Um, but when you get into the omnis, it gets, it gets a little gnarly. You have to really stop and define what you mean. Omniscience is just knowing reality as it is, knowing all true propositions. Not all things are eternally static and frozen. They're in maintaining an eternal truth value. Um, so I, I, I hold to a dynamic view of omniscience. But omnificent 
created all things, having unlimited powers of creation. God can create. Yeah. Um, hold on a second. Provisionist perspective with the comment. Genesis 9 maintains we are all still made in God's image. Yeah. It's, just, it's not, it's not a, a, a shattered and fractured and, and destroyed image, but it is a, a wounded image marred by sin and mortality, marred by suffering. And those are the very things Christ took upon himself to, to heal and redeem. Um, yes, amen. I and my Father are one. Relationally, um, you know, I think that's the intention there because he also says he wants us to be one as he and his Father are one. So I think that's speaking more of relational than it is identity. Um, that may get me in trouble with some of y'all, but I'm okay with that. Um, yeah, ransom is definitely a rescue. Um, and I'm going to scroll through these. Let's see where we are here. Second death is the lake of fire. Yes, it is. Amen to that. All right. So question, how does eternal conscious torment distort the nature of God less than Calvinism does? If I got you right, you hold to annihilationism. Yeah, I, I hold to destruction, uh, conditional security, conditional uh, immortality. Um, I, I don't, I don't know if it's necessarily distorting the nature of God as much as it's distorting the nature of eternal life um, and, and what the Scripture says about what awaits us. So I don't, I don't hold to annihilationism. Because I think that uh, eternal, eternal conscious torment distorts the nature of God so much that I just think that it's not in keeping with the biblical data uh, and what it means to, to have eternal life. Um, but uh, that's kind of an unrelated topic, I think. So I just want to make sure that I'm trying to stay as focused on today's topic of total depravity, original sin. Bring the questions if you got them. If you don't ask them, you're going to have no one to blame but yourself. Get these in, folks. You only got four more hours before this live stream ends. <laughs> um, cool. All right. So let me uh, let me look through my notes here, and I'll see if there's a few verses uh, that I think maybe we should we should hit on. Uh, Genesis six five. The Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, a point here: if if this passage teaches total depravity. It took six entire chapters for God to do so, and after previously refuting it in Genesis chapter 4. Nowhere does Genesis 6-5 say that man is created with evil hearts, or that we're born spiritually dead, possessing Adam's guilt and sin nature, unable to understand the things of God and under his wrath. That is an assumption arising from presuppositions that have to be taken and read into the text. And... The preceding verse of Genesis 6-5 is speaking of adults engaged in marrying, not children or infants. Okay? This chapter immediately moves on to introduce Noah, calling him righteous. And again, Genesis 8-21 tells us when man's hearts have become set on wickedness, and it's by their youth. Now, this is the same Hebrew word that describes the age David fought Goliath. It's also the same age used to describe when men marry and have children and a few other things that are a little more less savory. Um, and yet, ironically, Calvinists will claim total depravity doesn't mean men are as evil as they could be. And yet this verse, speaking of these people, says they were only evil continually. And so you, you see some like inconsistency with their handling here. Um, let's look here. I addressed Job in my series. I'm not going to try and do that here today. Um, let's see if I've got any other passages worth bringing up while we're here. Psalm 143, verse 2. Enter not into judgment with your servant, for no one living is righteous before you. Total depravity, Warren. No one's righteous. Well, the word in question is sadak, which is rendered as righteous in this passage. However, the term contextually deals with self-righteousness, self-justification. As in Genesis 44, 16, where Judah said, what shall we say to my Lord? What shall we speak? Or how can we clear ourselves? So in Psalm 143, verse 2, it's basically saying no one is going to be able to defend themselves before you. They can't 
They can't talk their way out of what you know to be true. This isn't saying that God creates men as wicked and evil, but rather that having gone astray into sins and trespasses, man cannot justify himself. And so they'll take a passage about, hey, you can't, you can't defend yourself here. You, you're a sinner. You, you committed sins. And they'll say, see, that means they were created sinning. Two totally different concepts, and they're missing it. Second Chronicles 6.36. I'm going to shotgun a few of these for you. There is no one who does not sin. Second Chronicles 6.36. There is no one who does not sin. The passage says sin is an action, not an inherited state of being. The reality that men sin isn't in dispute. Just the unique claims of Augustinian anthropology that God creates a spiritually dead, guilty, and unable to respond or believe, and possessing a sinful nature, as none of this is present in the text. In uh, 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verses 22 through 23, Solomon says, quote, I hear from heaven and act and judge your servants. Or he says, hear from heaven and act and judge your servants, repaying the guilty by bringing his conduct on his own head, and vindicating the righteous by rewarding him according to his righteousness. And in verse 27, he says, Hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your servants, your people of Israel, when you teach them the good way in which they should walk, which is, again, a refutation of total inability. Um, Matthew 7, verse 11, If you then, being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask? Aha! You're evil. Total depravity. Well, the passage is not saying that men are created evil, and it's speaking to adults who have children. It says, you who are evil. The Greek word translated as evil is paneras, which deals with unethical people who practice unrighteousness and reap suffering. This is not saying they were created evil, but it's affirming that they can, in fact, ask God something. Right? They can ask God. And, and total depravity denies this. Uh, this evil is the same word used in Luke 6.45. The good person out of the good treasure of his heart produces good, and the evil person out of the evil treasure of his heart produces evil. For out of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaks. So we clearly see men are capable of both good and evil. It's not like a default state where we're just created sinful and guilty and hated by God. Let's do this, man. We're, we're tell Leighton I'm coming for him. Tell Leighton I'm coming for him. Eight hours all the way. Take up my whole, you know what? Let's do it for the week. Call in some pizza. Give me a bucket. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not leaving, man. I'm not sure who you're talking to here, um, uh, Grace, Mercy, and Wrath. Is that directed at me, sir? Um, I'd be happy to discuss that with you if it is. Let me know in the, the comments. I think you're talking to someone in the in the side chat, but I just want to make sure. If you've got a rebuke for me, I'm open to hearing it. Um, Hebrews 11, 6. And without faith, it is impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Okay. Okay, so you're you're not directing that at me. Cool, thank you. If, if you had a rebuke, I'm open to it. I've got a pretty thick skin and I've been wrong before, so I'll, I'll consider it if you got one. But Hebrews 11, 6. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. And they go, ah, without faith, it's impossible, Warren. Totally, de Total depravity. You've got to be regenerated and given faith. The passage doesn't say men are created unable to have faith. Romans 1 tells us the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. For what can be known about God is plain to them, because God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made, 
So they, the wicked, are without excuse. For although they knew God, wait a minute, they knew God? Yes, they departed from their state of innocence and simple reliance on God, and they departed and denied him like the fool in Psalm 58. <clears throat> For although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Wait a second. Weren't they born with dark hearts? No, they were born with innocent hearts. And by rebellion and disbelief, they grew dark. Hmm. So, let's keep going. The passage just said that God rewards those who seek him. Total depravity says there's not one. No, not one. So then who is God rewarding? No one? Oh, that was worth mentioning in Scripture. God does something that never he never accomplishes. It doesn't make sense. Hebrews 11 recounts the faith of Abel, Enoch, Noah, Abraham, Sarah, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, the people who crossed the Red Sea, the faith of those who marched on Jericho, Rahab, Gideon, Barak, Samson, David, Samuel, the prophets. And nowhere does it say that they were created unable to have faith, requiring pre-faith regeneration. Mark 7, verses 15 through 21 Oh, hey, hold on a second here. We got a question. I'm going to stop. I'm going to stop my rambling. Let's interact. Uh, can you explain Ezekiel 18, verse 21, if you haven't already? I think I did. Pretty sure I did. Let me go back and look at that real quick. Um, I know I got to Ezekiel. Let's look at what verse 20 says. The person who sins will die. A son will not suffer the punishment for the father's guilt. Nor will a father suffer the punishment for the son's guilt. The righteousness of the righteous will be upon him, and the wickedness of the wicked will be upon him. Yes, I, I've already addressed that and was noting how guilt is not inherited. Consequence can. If I became an alcoholic and a child abuser, my kids would suffer. They're not guilty, but they suffer for my sins. And um, so the Bible isn't eliminating consequence from sin. It's eliminating guilt. And a lot of times the innocent suffer as a consequence for the guilt of another. And we can see Christ choosing to lay down his life in our place, suffering the consequence of sin, suffering in death in our stead. Um, yeah, Hebrews 11 is all about obedience. And we can, we can obey God. We're not going to stand before him and go, well, Father, I know you told me not to. But you created me to where I had to. It's not going to work that way. Um, let's pull up this. What am I looking at here? Getting back to Mark 7, verses 15 through 21, there's a point here where it says, There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile. And a lot of times you'll hear people say, oh, well, that just shows that the inward man is already defiled and we were created that way. But the passage says men defile themselves, meaning they go from not defiled to being defiled. So their total depravity claims that they're created defiled, and the passage is saying, no, they become that. And in the preceding verse, God actually called the people to him, and he told them, hear me, all of you, and understand. But total depravity says that's impossible. Okay. So we can go on and on and on and on. And I think I've proven that. I think, okay, here we go. Let's, let's look at this. Isaiah 53, verse 6. All we like sheep have been created astray. No, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. It doesn't say we're created wicked and following Adam's way. And you'll notice this is this is about individual responsibility, individual uh, guilt for their individual sins. Uh, here's one too, Isaiah 64, verse 6. But we are all as an unclean thing, and all our, all our righteousness are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, have taken us away. The passage just said, we become unclean. Not that we're created unclean. And in the preceding verse, it says, you meet him joyfully who works righteousness, 
those who remember you in your ways. It also says that our iniquities have taken us away. Another reference to men departing their natural state of innocence and venturing into sin. So what you see is, is over and over and over again, all of these proof texts. I mean, I have, I have a huge database of these uh, that I've been compiling over the years. Huge database of all the proof texts. And time and time and time again, they either don't teach original sin and total depravity or they flatly refute it. But the adherent just doesn't see it because they're reading into terms, definitions that the text never meant. Um, I feel that God having omnificence proves that determinism can only be false and shows that determinism denies the power of God and autonomy, free will glorifies an omnipotent God. Yeah, um, I would have to look more into that argument. I'd have to consider that more on the, the, the face of it. It sounds nice. I just have to confess my ignorance as to the uh, aspect of an impact of omnificence. It's something I haven't considered yet. That's why I like these exchanges. I, I get challenged in different ways. Um, looking through here. Um, cool. So um, here we go. Let's look at Micah. Micah 7 verses 2 through 3. Uh, the godly, actually, let me pull this up on the screen so I'm not just ranting. Give you guys something to look at. Do, 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 do. Here we go. And what was the verse I was looking at? Seven. Yeah. The godly person has perished from the land, and there is no upright person among mankind. All of them lie in wait for bloodshed. Each of them hunts the other with a net. As for evil, both hands do it well. The leader asks for a bribe, also the judge. And the great one speaks of the capricious desire of his soul. So they plot together. It's kind of foreboding. All right. Pull up the whole context here. Uh, it doesn't say that God creates men ungodly. This is one of those things where people have to like read it into the text. And it says the godly have perished from the earth, talking about that specific era, that, sp that specific time, there were godly men who had been killed. By who? By wicked. The prophet then clarifies that this isn't applicable to everyone as he's excluding himself, saying, but as for me, I will look to the Lord. I will wait for the God of my salvation. My God will hear me. And we see how he's confident that God is relational. God is responsive, right? That can only happen in a temporal instance where God is able to actually interact. Um, let's look and see. Anything else? Well, guys, I am going to have to go get my son from school. I don't think I'm going to be able to beat Layton's record today. I think we gave it. I think we gave it our all. I appreciate you for joining me. I just don't think I don't think I'm going to be able to compete with Layton. Um, I think his record is what seven and a half hours. <laughs> so, um, but I do appreciate everybody for tuning in today. I hope that you've all in, enjoyed this to some extent. I hope you've been blessed by this. And uh, uh, until next What's time, what's wrong with you people? I appreciate you all. God bless, and I'll catch you on the next one. The only way to get there was to float through the terrifying void between us.